welcome to another episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast, and I'm your host, the Sensible Hippie. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a very special guest, someone whose remarkable story has been a topic of much fascination. You might have already heard about Roy Stubblefield, especially if you are into the mysterious and the unexplained. His encounter with what he describes as a werewolf in New Orleans was featured in the Travel Channel's These Woods Are Haunted show, episode three of season three. But as it often happens with tales so bizarre and so intriguing, the true essence of his experience wasn't truthfully captured. So today, Roy joins us to set that record straight. This is a rare opportunity to hear the untold details of a night that defies all explanation. A night where the line between the unknown and the known was blurred. So brace yourselves for part one of this compelling two part series. And we are going to dive in Roy's firsthand account of this extraordinary encounter that happened in July of 1981. Thank you again for coming on the Sensible Hippie Podcast. I really appreciate that. Um, so you are Roy Stubblefield. And your experience was on the Travel Channel, um, Season 3, Episode 3. I know that was a very popular uh, episode. Um, do you feel that they accurately portrayed your experience? No, I do not. I do not, and I have had conversations with the producer about that because... They did a four, we did a four hour interview. Okay. And they recorded everything. And they were asking questions. And what they did was they took some of my audio and inserted words that I said in places where I didn't say them. I did five or six, uh, been on five or six podcasts, and I never ever said that the guy shot the creature. I never said that. Um, of course, if you listen to the audio, it says the guy shot it, and that's what made it run off. That is not true. That is not true. And I actually sent you a link, I believe, to when I was on Dogman Account Radio, and you can hear me say somebody even said, don't shoot it. So I was not happy with that. Also, I'm sorry for the air I was supposed to have some input on the design of the creature. That never happened, but if you notice, they kept it so much in the shadows, you pretty much just got a profile of it, but not the, the, the depiction of the creature as I described it to him. And I was like, okay. I said, okay, well, you know, you guys reached out to me. So do what you do, but I even asked him, why did you have to change anything that I told you? Well, we thought it would make it more exciting for television. It would be more, I said, so you mean to tell me after everything that I shared with you, you thought that it would be more scary to change what I told you if you had to just stuck to what I said? That should have terrified anybody. Well, you know, this is, <laughs> I, and I didn't even let him finish. I said, you know what, never mind. It's recorded. It's out there. But understand, anybody that reaches out to me or if I do another podcast, I will be letting them know if they watch that episode that you did not depict my encounter correctly. Okay, well, you can do what you want to. I said, God says I can, so you're right. I can, as long as I don't break any laws. So, um, and I'm going to say this real quick and then I'll jump into it. Since I've been on TV, and I did a little checking because people, you know, I got so much response, you know, that man, that was an incredible encounter, you know, did that really happen to you? And I'm like, I said, first of all, dude, I'm not looking for fame or notoriety. I am telling people about this, one, because I needed to get it off my chest. 
This is something that's it's been branded in my brain. No matter how old I get, I'm going to always remember this. I said, but the second reason I did it is because I want people to know you don't have to be in the woods to see these things. You can be right in a neighborhood, and I was in a neighborhood. And third, I was hoping that one of the guys I was with would actually hear that and reach out to me. That's why I always say my full name and where I was at, and that way they could contact me and I could find out what happened the next day. That how did the rest of you guys' lives go? You know, what happened? But unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet. So I still got hope, but people just need to be aware that this planet that we have, there are things here that fall outside the norm of what you consider a natural animal. Um, I don't know what they are. A lot of people say they don't believe in werewolves, but they'll say, well, I believe in a skinwalker. In my opinion, they're almost one and the same. Because a physical change is supposed to take place uh, when a shaman uses whatever pelt or feathers to change to an animal, then he has to change back. And another thing I found is wives' tales, fairy tales, um, scary stories, uh, all of them have a shred of truth, a shred. That's how they got started. I just can't see how somebody would be sitting in their hut or at home one night and be like, I think I'm going to tell my kids that werewolves exist. That way that's going to scare them and make them be good. And then sit down and talk about a person changing from a human being into one of these things and back in that. They'll tear you limb for limb. So, uh, But everybody has their own opinion, of course. But I just know what I seen and I know what I felt. I never said that I saw her change, but I'm sure you've been some places where you've seen another person where you were driving, just kind of look to the left or look to the right, and you just got a feeling like something's off about that person. So, yep, I have. Mm -hmm. um, having said all of that, now I'll go ahead and get into my encounter. Um, I was living in Omaha. Nebraska at the time before I went to Louisiana and I was staying with my cousin and my aunt and my aunt she was younger so she really didn't want to be called aunt she told me to call her by her first name which was Pat so that's what I did and I guess I had been there I know I stayed with her for at least a couple of and I had graduated that year. And she came home one day and uh, said, we need to have a family meeting. Now, usually when she says this, that means somebody didn't do something. And now we about to we about to hear about it. So I'm looking at my cousin and I had another we had another cousin that was standing with us too. So I'm looking at them like Okay, what didn't y'all do? And they looked at me, what didn't you do? I'm like, okay, you cut the grass, the leaves got raked up, the, the grass skipping was raked up. Yeah, the dishes done, yeah. Okay, did you clean the basement? Yeah, you know, I'm going through the list. And they like, man, I don't know what she's going to talk about. We did her. So she comes out of her room, you know, we sitting at the dining room table, and she said, in two weeks, I'm going to be moving to New Orleans. And I'm going to leave the house to you guys. I need to make sure y'all can pay the rent, utilities, and keep the property up. Now, you're talking to three teenage boys. And my other cousins were younger than me uh, by two and three years. So one cousin, he's kicking me up under the table. He's kicking my foot when he hears this. Like, and I know what he, where he's going with it because you know, I'm thinking the same thing. Wait a minute. You move into another state and you're going to leave us in this house by ourselves. It's about to be on this summer. It's about to be on. <laughs> Can't nobody tell us nothing. It's about to be on. So it took me a few years after this to actually think about it. But my aunt, for her to do that, 
and you leaving your 16 year old son here by himself, that doesn't make you a very good mother. <laughs> That's illegal today. <laughs> right. You leaving your son here unsupervised. But there's a story behind that, and I'll talk to you about that off air. So we like, okay, well, um, you know, that's all we said. We was kind of shell shocked. Just like, okay. So she got up and went in the kitchen, and she called me in the kitchen. I'm like, some more good news. I found thinking some more good news. So she's like, well, I'm gonna need you to help me drive down in New Orleans, and the following Friday, I'm gonna put you back on the uh, Continental Trailways and send you back to Omaha. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. And also at that time. I was going through a breakup with my first serious relationship. So getting out of town for a few days, I felt would do me good. You know, I can clear my head up a little bit and kind of get my feet back on me, if you will, because it did kind of knock my feet off. Reminded me the way we broke up, but life happens. So we got the U-Haul packed up and we left that Saturday. It took us about 35 hours to get to Omaha to New Orleans. And I was like, wow, that was a long drive. But when we arrived in town, she had already got her apartment and stuff. So we just took the beds out and took them upstairs so we had something to sleep on. And we just crashed out. And then the next day we got unloaded to New haul in. There's one thing I'm going to always appreciate <clears throat> about I over under overestimating a person. Because she was only 5'2", yet she was helping me move dressers just up, you know, to the second story, heavy stuff. And I'm looking at her like, you okay? She's like, yeah, I got this. And I'm just looking at her like, man, I don't ever want to get in a fight with you. Cause, you know, she had Duncan five stuff, and that's really heavy. So we got all that done, and she said, um, I'm going to take you around to some places so you can get the chance to see the city. I'm like, oh, okay, I appreciate that. Well, the first place she took me was the Popeye's Chicken. We didn't have Popeye's Chicken in Nebraska. When I had some of that chicken, I was like, oh, my God, I literally want to kiss the cook. I literally want to kiss the This is, <clears throat> I mean, it was something different for me. And Southern cooking is very good. I mean, it is. So... We did that, and she took me to a couple of other places. And then we went down to the French Quarter. It was on a Thursday. And I'm walking around looking. These people is having a good time. They ain't nobody fighting, cussing. They, they got alcohol in their hands. And I'm looking like, wait a minute. You can't walk down the street drinking alcohol in Nebraska. That, that's the fastest way to go to jail. But there were even police down there. They was, you know, just walking, doing their patrolling. These, there were street vendors on the corner, and they were selling these big 32-ounce drinks, a hurricane, a tropical storm, and a cyclone. And I'm like, let me get one of them a seat. I took two sips, and I looked at that. I said, I don't want to go back to Nebraska. Can I stay? And she was like, wait a minute. You're supposed to be going back home for Heidi. I'm like, well, why can't I stay? She's like, well, weren't you planning on going to school this fall? I'm like, I can go to school here. <laughs> she said, well, you know you're going to have to get a job. I'm like, of course. I, I can, well, I can do both. Can I stay? I just need you to give me enough time to give me a little money put up, and I'll even get my own place. So she was like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do. And I'm like, okay. I didn't call my cousin until a week later and tell him, man, I'm coming back. Just put my stuff in some boxes and I'll be up there to get it when I can. And uh, it took me, I think it was eight days. It might have been seven or eight days to get a job. And I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but there used to be a clothing store called Chess King back in the day. Um, if you wanted... The type of stuff they sold was if you wanted to look like your famous uh, musician, whether it be Michael Jackson, the Flock of Seagulls, Duran Duran, you went to to Chess King. Um, when he had, uh, he came out with the uh, the Thriller video, Michael Jackson with the red, the black and red jacket. 
yeah, we had an abundance of those. So you could, you know, put your wardrobe together. Like I said, if you want to look like a rock star, R&B, whatever. And it was on Canal Street, which is a main street downtown. Um, it was a decent sized shop. And we had mostly men's clothes, but we had a small section for women. And I was in there working and my manager actually worked with me. I don't know if it was by design or if that just was the, the hours that she had available. And I worked in the daytime and that was good. So one day I was uh, rotating some stock. We had I got a new order in. And I was rotating some of the old stuff back to put it back in the storage. And you know the stores that have that little bell above the door for when you come in? Well, we have one of them. Because I might be in the back or something. I hear that tingle, tingle, and I'm like, okay, let me get out here. Well, the bell went off, and I'm down on my knees, hanging out these, pulling up these shirts, and I was hanging up the new ones. And I kind of turned around and looked. And oh my God, this woman, girl, whatever term fits best, was walking in the store. And when I looked at her, I was like, she got everything that Uncle John did. The biscuits, the bacon, and the gravy, everything. <laughs> but I'm at work, so... I can't, you know, say anything to her as if I was met her on the street or something. So I looked at her and I, you know, got up and I walked over, you know, said, welcome to Chess King. Is there anything I can help you with? She said, well, I just want to look around for a minute. If I find something, if I need some help, I'll, I'll let you know. I said, okay. Take your time. And I went back to doing what I was doing. But I was steadily looking over there at her. But I'm like... I started thinking, what can I say? What can I say? What can I say? Because I don't, you know, my boss is there. So if I am going to say something, I got to make sure that I don't straddle that sexual harassment law, even though it wasn't really that big back then as it is now. But I'm at work. I'm not trying to lose my job. So I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm like, you know what? Stop thinking of pickup lines. And just introduce yourself. Just for a change, just introduce yourself and just talk to her. So I was swapping out some shirts and I was actually working in the women's section. And I looked over at her and she kind of gave me that look like, you know, can you help me? So I walked over. She, she asked me, um, I like these shirts. Do you have these in any other colors? I said, yes, these just came in actually. Um, I got three different colors in the back. I said, what size you wear? You look like you're about a medium. And, she, you know, she kind of smiled. She's like, yeah, but you can bring a small, too. So I went in the back, and I got the shirts, and I came out. I had a red, purple, and orange one, I believe. And, you know, I had them on my arm, and I held them out. She's like, well, I like the orange one. Not too big a fan of purple, but I know she chose two shirts. I think she got an orange one and a black. And then she was looking at some slaps. And I just said, I said, hey, um, what's your name? And she told me, and I don't have my journal in front of me, so I, I can't say her name. And I think even if I did, I don't want to say her name. I've never done that since it because <laughs> if I'm right, then I don't want her to be like, uh, now I know where you are. Let me come and finish what I started. So um, she gave me her name. And I said, well, I'm new in town and I need somebody to show me around. Can I take you out on a date? And she didn't say anything for a few seconds. She kind of looked me up and down. And then she looked me right in her eyes and I was looking at her eyes and I'd never seen eyes like that before. They were like a greenish gold. But in a few minutes, I seen something else that I've never seen before that or since. So we was walking up to the counter. Now, during this time when she first came in, my boss was actually helping another customer. And they had finished up 
So she's standing at the end of the counter and she's watching. And every now and again, I would look over at her to see if she was going to give me a disapproving look like, you know, this is not what you're here for. But she didn't say nothing. She was just standing there looking and she kind of had a little grin on her face. So we got her through the counter. I said, okay, so um, let me get that telephone number. Now, the whole time I was talking to her before this, she always was looking me in my eyes. As soon as I said that, she broke eye contact and she kind of looked down and to the left. Now, I had looked at her hands and everything because I'm looking for a ring. I ain't trying to encroach on nobody else's territory. And I didn't see a ring. I didn't even see where she might have been wearing it and took it off that little uh, tan line that you get. So I'm freaking okay. Left. Worst case, she got a boyfriend. She's like, well, I can't give you my phone number. And I kind of cocked my head and looked at her. I'm like, what? So I'm like, okay, well, what's your address? This time she looked to the right and she's looking down. She's like, I can't give you my address. See, that's when I'm like, oh, man, really? That's when I'm like, okay, so you must got a boyfriend. A husband or maybe even a girlfriend I don't know but <laughs> alright so, and she she snapped her head back up like she actually read my thoughts she's like no I'm not married I don't have no boyfriend my mom won't let no me and her boys come by the house now that wasn't unheard of back then but I wasn't expecting that from her I said, okay, well, if we're going to go on a date, how am I supposed to meet you? She's told me there's a park about two blocks from my house. Just show up there at 7 o'clock, and we'll, we'll leave from there. And I'm like, okay, that'll work. That'll work. You know, maybe you're doing this for your own safety, and as you get to know me, then, you know, if you'll trust me enough to come out of your house or tell your mom about them, you know, how it's supposed to go. I'm like, okay. So she completed her transaction and I walked her to the door and I was holding the door for her. Now, of course, I am a man and I was a young man then, so I'm not going to lie. The whole time she was walking, I don't think my eyes went above her waist. I just want to say, <laughs> I don't think they did. And I'm not being mad or anything. I'm just being honest. But when she got to the door, I held it open for her. And at that time of day, the angle of the sun was actually coming into the front windows of the store. So when she turned to look at me, I was looking, you know, at her in her face. And for just a hot second, there was a gold ring around her pupil. But you could only see it with the light hit her eyes at right. And I, it, you know, I was... You know, I actually kind of, you know, I didn't back up, but I kind of leaned back a little bit like colorful language. I've never seen eyes like that before in my life. You have some gorgeous eyes. He's like, thank you. I'm like, no, really. I've never seen eyes like that before. You are. It, it just. It makes me wonder about certain things. But anyway, I, I like I said, I've never seen eyes like that before or since then. And I guess in some ways that should have tipped me off to something, but I'm young. I don't know nothing about monsters other than books and Hollywood and stuff like that. I'm not thinking about what she could possibly be or none of that stuff. I'm thinking about I got a date with it, you know, a very good looking woman, you know, and we were supposed to go out that Friday. And this was on a Wednesday when I met her. I remember that. It was July 7th. It was July 7th. And so I turned around to go back to the counter. And my boss is standing there looking at me. She's like, you pretty smooth. You know that? And I'm like, huh? What do you mean? She said, I like the way you handle that. I'm like, I didn't do anything. She said, most guys would have said something, you know, 
get out of here. Why are you playing? You can't give me your number or your address, man. You, you know, why are you playing? She said, and you just went out missing the beach and just kept going right on. I'm like, well, she could be telling the truth. She said, yeah, she could be. She said, but I like the way you did that. I'm like, but I'm not in trouble, right? She's like, no, you're not in trouble. You, you handled yourself, you know, well. I'm like, okay. So we was talking, and it took me about five minutes. I'm see, I'm like, Oh my God, Roy, you dumb as hell. <laughs> and my boss said, What? I'm like, I forgot to ask her where the park was at. And my boss said, Oh, I know where it's at. I'll draw your map. I'm like, You know where it's at? She said, Yeah, it's up in Medford. And I'm like, Where is that at? She said, I'm going to draw you a map. So she drove me a turn by turn map and said, If you you get up into Medford, if you drive past the Wind Dixie, it's a grocery store on the right hand side. Then you went too far. You might turn around and come back. I'm like, I'm not gonna miss my turn. So I'm kind of excited. Thursday just seemed like it drug and drug and drug. And then Friday come and my boss said, "You know what, Roy?" I said, "No, nah, I don't know what." But I'm pretty sure he's gonna tell me. He said, "You were actually supposed to close tonight. Like we close at nine o'clock." And I was like, "Oh man," I said. I wasn't even thinking about that. She said, I'm going to do your favor. I'm going to stay in close tonight. But you owe me. I said, as long as I owe you, you'll never be broke. So be good. <laughs> <laughs> and so she closed that night. But I actually purchased my outfit that I was going to wear on a date from the store. You know, I used my little employee discount and did that. So... I think I left a little bit after six and I start driving to the park. And I'm, you know, running some different scenarios through my head, um, my do's and don'ts. But I got to the park 655, 656, because it's about 20, 22, 23 miles away. And I get to the park, and it's not a big park. If you get 100 people in there, y'all be rubbing elbows. But there were some uh, boys and girls, men and women in the park. Women to have their kids on the playground equipment. But there was a, a basketball court, and it had the three-tier bleachers on one side of it. Now, in Louisiana... It rains a lot, and you very seldom get sprinkles. It's like somebody just turn overturn a five gallon bucket and it come pouring down like that because it it can flood within fifteen minutes on any street there because the soil is like a, a clay, so it takes time for that water to run off. But they got plenty of drainage ditches around. But a lot of the outdoor basketball, well, the outdoor basketball course, they have this tin roof over them over the whole course so if it's raining you can still play unless the wind start blowing it sideways and then it becomes hazardous because there's water on the court so it had one of them at least you know with some guys playing there's people sitting on the beach so i got out and i walked up and i sat down on the edge of the beach i have on <coughs> some shorts a button-up shirt and some sandals and while i'm sitting there I started cursing inside because I put on cologne. The mosquitoes in Louisiana, I swear, some of them were big like miniature helicopters. And I'm talking about big mosquitoes. And if too many get on you, I'm pretty sure they can take a pint or two out. And I'm not kidding. Mosquitoes are bad there. And, of course, I got cologne on, so I'm slapping and popping. And I got a little towel, and I'm swatting and stuff. And I'm like, oh, my. Uh, she need to hurry up. So I checked my watch. It was a little bit after seven. Well, it was a group of six guys that were sitting not too far. Man, they had been talking, but they looked at me when I walked up, but they didn't say nothing. One of these guys got up and he walked over to me. And he said, hey, man, uh, you want to play basketball with us next? And. I looked at him, and then I kind of looked down at what I was wearing, and then I looked back up at him like, dude, I'm not, I'm not dressed to play basketball. I said, no, nah, you know, um, 
I'm I'm waiting on somebody. And he said, oh, yeah, who's that? Now, maybe it's a time frame or maybe just where I'm from. But if a total stranger walk up to you and ask you, you know, about your business, it's basically none of your business. <laughs> so, but I wasn't going to be rude like that. I just was like, well, when she get here and you see her, if you know her, then you'll know who I'm waiting on. He said, oh, okay. He said, by the way, man, my name is Herman. I said, what's up, Herman? My name is Stubb. That's my nickname. So we dapped up, and he sat down and started talking to me. Okay. No, we just, you know, where are you from? Nebraska. He said, Nebraska? He said, I, I know you got an accent, and I busted out laughing when he said that. I'm like, I'm from Nebraska. You from Louisiana, and you got the nerve to tell somebody that they got an accent, but I didn't realize that I do have an accent. <laughs> I just, to me, I never, I just, I'm tone deaf to it, I guess, but we just talking, so here come one of the other guys. Hey, man, you going to play basketball with us or what? And I'm not here to play basketball. Can't you tell by what I got on? He's like, oh, what you here for? I'm like, I'm waiting on somebody. Who's that? Again, when she get here, you see her, you'll know who I'm waiting on. Now, until eventually, all the guys came over. Now, they was giving me names, but... I'm pretty sure these were names on adversity. Diamond, Little Bit, Shorty, Mac, um, and names like that. And I'm, I just told them my name was Stubb. But we sat there and we, you know, chit chatted till they wouldn't play. But I didn't get a sense that they were up to anything wrong. It just seemed to me like some dudes that was at the park on a Friday night, and rather than being out selling drugs or robbing liquor stores or murdering or raping somebody they choose to spend their time in the park um, I'm sorry that bird I might have to go inside but they went and played basketball and I checked my watch now it's a little bit after 7 30. 7 35 come 7 40 come by 7 45 I started getting that feeling in my stomach I done drove all the way out here to Istanbul, and she done stood me up. Man. I said, okay, well, it's still early enough. I'm going to just go down and you know, get, go get something to eat and go down in the French quarters, and I'm going to just make a night of it. So I'm getting ready to leave about 5 to 8, and Herman said, what happened, man? What happened? She stood you up? I said, it looks that way. He said, well... You might as well stay and play basketball with us. Now, I've been fishing since I was 12. And I always keep a change of clothes in the trunk of my car. And one fishing pole and a small tackle box. And some tennis shoes because I never know when I'm be out driving somewhere and I see a body of water that looks like I need to find all the scent. So I had that in the trunk of my car. And I actually, I had just got this car. I had got a 1978 Monte Carlo. It was copper with a half white top, and it had the velour interior on the seat. I loved that car. I mean, I absolutely loved it. I'm like, man, this is my first vehicle. I got it. Yeah, I'm going to treat you like a baby. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. So I went in the bathroom and changed clothes, put my stuff in the other clothes I had on the, the car, and I went and played basketball with it. Now, we play basketball off and on until midnight because also these outdoor basketball courts, Monday through Thursday, the lights stay on until 9 o'clock. Okay, I got to go inside. My neighbor's dogs are just, <laughs> they're being rude, and I don't know what they're barking. I'm just a bit, I'm sorry. What year was this? 1981. <laughs> it was 1981. And the, um, 
once I changed my clothes, I'm sorry, I lost my place for a minute. Once I changed my clothes, we went out there and played basketball, and I played basketball with them off and on for the next four hours because, oh, that's where I left off. Um, the lights. public parks, the lights stay on till 9 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. Uh, Fridays, they stay on till 10. And then Saturdays, they stay on till midnight. And then Sunday, they don't turn them on at all. So, like I said, when we weren't playing basketball, we were sitting on the bleachers talking about what we did wrong, what we needed to do to win the next game, you know, stuff like that. Or they was asking me questions about Nebraska. So, when the lights went off, I'm like, all right, fellas, well, I guess I'll see y'all later. And I was going to go to the car, and I stopped, and I'm like, hey, where's the closest liquor store? You know, after drinking that hot faucet water <laughs> in the park, I'm like, I need a cold beer. And I believe it was Diamond that said, well, hey, <clears throat> we about to go right now. Um, we just piecing up some chains together to decide, you know, what we going to get. I said, well, I got $5 on it. Y'all come up with the rest. We get a 12-pack or a case of beer, and you know, we can do this. So they were there trying to count their change up, and it's dark in the park. You only got lights from the street light now coming into the park. And they said, okay, man, we ready. Now, at this time, I made a decision that changed my life. Because I could have let these six sweaty dudes get in my mind of Carlo. But that's my baby. I'm like, no. No, 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 no. Y'all not getting in here. You froze. Can you hear me? Hello? What happened? Hello, I don't hear you anymore. Are you there? Froze. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah, I'm here. It froze for a minute. I'm okay. Sure. Yeah, it did. That was strange. As soon as you went in. Um so I, I was telling you about the decision I made. So mm -hmm. I just pride, vanity, call it what you will. I'm like, I'm not getting in my car. And I think you froze did again. It again. What? Okay. You froze again. Yeah, I'm wondering what's going on. I'm looking. I got a good connection. Okay, I'm sorry You're about fine that. Outside. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I know. I was closer to my um, internet when I was in the back. So, I'm going to try this again and see what's going on. The, um, I just wasn't going to let them guys get in my car. I just, no, no. Now, at this time, I had bought a gun when I was in Nebraska. I had a 357 Magnum. And it was in the trunk of the car. I never considered grabbing it because, as I said, I didn't feel like I was in any danger. But I was with these dudes. I'm like, if y'all gonna do something, I'm in y'all neighborhood. You know, y'all could have waited until, you know, shortly after everybody left out of the park to do what you're going to do. Now, when I was headed out to the park, I had to come up this thing is called Airline Highway. Airline Highway is not that far. It's like maybe a half a block from where I was at. So, they we exit out the other side of the park <clears throat> And we walk down the street like we're going to Airline Highway, but there's some railroad tracks right there. And trains run all over uh, Louisiana. Um, 
I didn't think it bought anything out of the ordinary for that. But they turn to go down the railroad tracks. I don't know why initially I'm thinking we're going to walk to Win Dixie because it was it probably was about three quarters of a mile away. But they turned and got on the railroad tracks and started walking down the tracks. Now, on the left side of the tracks, there's three buildings. It's a junkyard, a tire shop, and a lumber yard. On the right side, it's this field of thistles. Now, I don't know if you know what a thistle is, but when it starts off growing, it looks like a dandelion. It's got those leaves with the little little needles on them. Well, thistles grow in Nebraska. They usually top out about five, six feet. But they get these long leaves on them, and they got a single purple flower on the top. But the way they grow, they're, they're just in mass. I mean, a whole bunch right there. So if you would just happen to run through them, Trust me, you get hit by them, them needles, and I call them hypodermic needles because if they stick you, you're going to know you've been stuck. Now, since it rained so much in Louisiana, the thistles I was seeing was seven to eight feet tall. But when you get on the railroad tracks and the sides kind of fall away so you're, type, you're elevated, I could barely see over some of them. But I guess that field was maybe a 100 150 yards as I'm looking to my right. But you can see behind them, there were houses. It was a neighborhood. I mean, right across the street from the park, there were houses right there. I was in the neighborhood. I wasn't rural or anything like that. And <clears throat> I could see some back porch lights on. Or if you're looking at the right angle between the houses, you could see the house across the street had maybe their front porch light on. So... We're walking, crunching on them white rocks, and me and Herman were bringing up the rear. And I'm looking around, and Herman, just out of the blue, he said, hey, man, um, he started asking me questions about kids, but babies, you know. Um, how often do you got to feed them a newborn baby? And I'm like, when they hungry, but usually it's every two, two and a half hours. He's like, oh, you know, how much you feed them? Two to four ounces. And, I, you know, I thought it was strange, but it didn't really resonate with me that there was something, <laughs> you know, where he was going with it. So then he said, well, you not know change diapers? I said, yeah, I know I changed diapers. Is it hard? So I explained to him about changing diapers. And then, you know, I'm kind of looking at him side eye like, you know, dude, what? <laughs> then he said, well, when they get sick, how do you know they're sick? I said, you take them to the hospital. Oh, well, you, so you don't know what be causing a fever or something like that? I'm like, that's what the doctor's for. And I'm like, why are you asking all these questions about kids, man? What, what, what's going on? He said, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and he said it just like that. He said, man, he's like, I'm scared to death, man. I'm like, what you scared for? He said, my girl's going to have a baby in the next week or two. And, I, I, you know, I don't know nothing about kids. And I started smiling because I thought of something my grandmother had said. I said, well, you know what? The damage is done now. I don't know why you scared now. <laughs> you should seem like you either should have been scared whatever time y'all was sneaking around having your little trias. That's when you should have been scared about being discovered. And he said, what's a trias? I said, a hookup. Okay, it's just a hookup. He's like, oh, why you just didn't say that? I said, I did. But anyway, he said, well, my, you know, man, I said, well, what are you so scared about? He said, because I don't want to be the type of father my father was. I said, what kind of father do you have? He said, he wasn't ever around. He said, I know who he is and I know where he lived at, but 
you know, we don't talk. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, man. But I said, you just answered your own question. He said, what you mean? I said, you said you didn't want to be like your father, right? He said, yeah. I said, then don't. Then don't. Don't leave your son or daughter just because you're not getting along with the mom. Don't do that. Always be there for that kid. You don't have to be with your, your child's parent, uh, mom in order to be a good father. And since you already have lived that life, of not having your father be prevalent in your life. And I guess some of the things I was saying because of the words I was using, he might not have got because he was asking me, what does prevalent mean? So I had to kind of, and no offense to him, but I kind of had to dumb it down a little bit. I said, it means that you shouldn't, I said, I'm not going to give you the definition if you want to know, look it up, but you just want to make sure you be a better father. Be there for your kid. Just be there for your kid, regardless of what's going on with, with his mom or her mom. Be there for your kid. He's like, well, that's the plan he said. He said, but I'm just scared because I don't know nothing. I said, well, you know, the most important part, you know how to get somebody pregnant. Now you just got to learn the rest. I said, ask your mom and your grandmother if you got any questions about kids. If they can't answer it, go to the library and get a book. Now, I knew about kids. I wasn't no expert then, but I knew about kids. So he was like, okay, so I'm looking, you know, we walking, I'm looking around. And he's like, what, did you see something? I said, no, man, it's dark as I don't know what back here because <clears throat> behind those three buildings that I mentioned earlier, there's one single street light behind each building, but they're spaced far enough apart that you can walk under the light of one, but in between you getting to the second light, there's an area of gloom. And I went out, it's, it's dark. If I was to see somebody walking toward me up the tracks, I would see their silhouette if they weren't directly under light. And I'll tell you what their silhouette looked like, but I couldn't describe what their facial features were. So we were under the first light because, as I said, we was walking in the rear of everybody else. And I'm looking around and. And he asked me, you know, did you see something? He said, I said, no. He said, well, there's a big black dog that stay in the junkyard. And I looked over at the junkyard like, really? He said, yeah. And sometime he get out. He said, I don't know what type of dog it is. He, he might be, he looked like he half lab and half Rottweiler, half Rottweiler and German Shepherd, but it's a big black dog. I'm like, oh, that's nice to know. I said that to myself. He's like, uh, if he get out. He gonna run toward you, just pick up some rocks and throw them at him and start hollering. And usually he, you know, he gonna keep barking. He might growl, but he gonna run off. I'm like, oh, okay. Now that is good to know. Okay. I said, but no, I didn't see no dog. So we're walking out of the first light into that area of gloom. And we still kind of make a small talk. He asked me a couple more questions about kids. But, you know, we're walking on these rocks and it's that crunch, 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 crunch. So, just before we got to the second street light, we just about to come out that area of gloom. And I was turning my head to look to the right. And something came out of them thistles. Now, at this time... I'm five foot eleven. I weigh two hundred twenty five pounds. I can bench press three hundred pounds and I can squat five hundred pounds. Cause I was playing football and I'm, you know, gearing up because I always wanted to play in the NFL. I'm not scared of no man, woman, child that walked this earth. I know even if it had been Andre the Giant Hulk Hogan, I knew enough about fighting that. My brother told me if you fighting a bigger opponent. Make them chase you around. They carrying all that extra mass. They going to start getting tired. As soon as you see them start sucking wind, chop the tree down. And he told me places to hit to bring them down. I'm like, okay. So I'm not worried about no. I wouldn't worry about any of them dudes. And also, I'm running a 4240 at this time. When I get ready to go, I'm going. <laughs> I 
and I'm going fast. So I knew I could outrun everybody that was with me because I had been doing it on the basketball court. So for some reason, when, like I said, I did not see it clearly. I just was looking to the right, and I seen something black in my peripheral. I didn't even turn my head to look and see it was. I took off running. <laughs> so I guess my primordial instinct kicked in to where it was like, you don't even want to see. Just know that it's dangerous, and you need to exit the vicinity. I took maybe four or five steps, and I'm about to downshift and go to that next year. And I heard, I don't know if you've ever heard before, but the sound of a body when it hits the ground on some rocks and slide a little bit. I heard that. And then Herman said, don't leave me. But I can't describe out of all the words I know I can't describe what it was in his voice other than to say it was heartrending. That was, I've never heard that in a human voice before. I mean, he, it was a scream and I'm, you know, I'm, so. I guess whatever he said, it, it, it affected me into my heart because I'm thinking it's that damn dog from the junkyard. I don't know if it tripped him or if he fell, but I ain't going to leave him to get mauled. Now, I just met them that night. It would have been normal human behavior to run off and leave him to his fate. But I'm like, I, I can't let him get because I've been bit by a dog before and it's not pleasant. So he said, some get some rocks, turn around and start hollering. <laughs> and, you know, so I kind of slid to a stop. Now, I don't know if it's just a black people thing or if it's a any race thing, but when you running and you start running by somebody, if they hear you running, they don't look back to see what you're running from. They just take off running. <laughs> we'll figure it out later on. We get safe. All we know is you're running for something, so it must be dangerous. Well, the other guys took off running because they heard me coming. They just bolted. So I don't know how far they ran down the tracks, but I slid to a stop, and I turned around. I bent down. I picked up two handfuls of rocks, and I cocked my right arm back, and I started running back toward where Herman was. Now, he's laying just outside of the second light. I could see him. He's on his back. He's propped up on his elbows and he's looking up and, you know, looking up. And I'm looking at what's on top of him. And I'm like, that is a big blankety blank dog. That that's a big dog because I could see the ears and the outline of the head. And but it was crouched down to where you know how if you tuck your chin down towards your chest, it had its nose tucked down like that because their faces might have been six, eight inches apart, but it was just focused on him. And I'm like, do, you know, do she got him? Do, do he? Does it have his, his face in his mouth? You know, how, you know, what the hell's going on? Because he wasn't growling, Herman wasn't screaming, he wasn't struggling. And I'm like, that is, I was just blown away by the size. Because he looked like a child up under an adult up under this thing. And I was like, what? I'm thinking dog, I'm thinking dog, but something's telling me. That's not matching up. That's that's. I mean, you can see the ears and the head, but that's not matching up. So, I I you know I got my my arm cocked and I'm standing there looking. 
because I'm trying to figure out, you know, what type of dog is this? He, they said big black dog, but he didn't say that this was no world record breaker. He just said big black dog. So I heard the guys start coming back down the tracks. And I'm standing directly in the middle of the tracks, and I can hear them. A lot of cursing. What the blank is that? What, 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 you know, what the blank is that? And it, you know, what, what is it doing to Hermie? You know, I'm hearing all this and I'm not saying nothing because I'm like, I got to, you know, what is this thing? And a few seconds later, I heard somebody say, don't shoot it. And I didn't know anybody had a gun. I found out later on when we got to the liquor store who had the gun because he had it in his little fanny pack. And I'm like, no, don't shoot it, idiot. I'm standing right here in the middle of the tracks. Now, I'm not about to turn around and look and see who got the gun because I need to keep my eyes on this thing in front of me. As soon as Shorty Mac said that, that thing looked up and then came two steps with put from just past the shoulders to the head under that second light. And the thing that rattled me the most first was this hand comes out of the dark and then laces down on the railroad track. I'm sorry, on the rocks. I ain't talking about no raccoon paw. I'm not talking about a dog's paw. I'm talking about a five-digit hand look just like mine, thumb in the same place, except for it's three times my size, and it's got these long claws on it. They were approximately two and a half, three inches. Now, they were curved, but they weren't wickedly curved. But they were curved enough so that when it set its hand down, the tips of the fingers would not make contact with the ground. It was on the claws. And I'm looking like, you know, I'm seeing this fur and this forearm, and I'm like, no, and I'm like, what, you know, colorful, 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 colorful language is that? <laughs> and when it started coming into the light, the eyes weren't glowing before then, so I'm assuming that they were reflecting the light that was there, but you see these golf ball size eyes with a black pupil, a little bitty black pupil, but the eyes were the color of if you take the full moon when it's yellow and the full moon when it's white and mix them, that's what color the eyes were, and it wasn't snarling, nothing like that, it just was looking, but this head I'm sorry that whenever I talk about this, it takes me back to that moment. That that head had to be 24, 26 inches. Now, there was fur. So, you know how a dog has a rough? So, when I say that measurement, I'm going from the rough to the rough. But just the muzzle was, it wasn't extremely long, but it was wide, like, I guess the best description, if I had to make a comparison between a breed of dog and what I seen, would be Alaskan Malamute. And, but just a whole lot bigger. And I'm looking and I'm like, okay, okay. Mom, something in my mind was like, okay, I'm looking at a blanking werewolf. <laughs> that that's That's what I'm looking at. Just... A calm voice in my head said that, and uh, you know, my arm has come down to my side, and I guess I'm just letting the rock trickle out, and this thing is looking, but it did a sweep and looked at all of us. It was a smooth motion with a slight hiccup, like, I see you, 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 and then it looked past me, and it must have been looking at the dude that had the gun, because the demeanor changed. The ears went back. And there was a low growl, but I could feel it. 
I don't know if it came from my feet and went up or my head and went down, but I could feel it. And, you know, the dudes, they really started freaking out then. Man, what the, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> that's a monster. It's a monster. It's a monster. I, I heard her keep saying that and I'm just like, I'm getting ready to die. I don't see no way out of the situation because when it came forward, it was less than 10 feet away from me. So I got a real good look, more than a look than I ever would have wanted to have. But just when you look at something and you know there's no way I'm going to survive a physical confrontation with this thing, that's the way I felt. I'm like, I'm getting ready to die. My if there's such a thing as your life flash before your eyes, that that's how we started to go. Because I'm thinking, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to be in one of the 33-gallon garbage bags in pieces. <laughs> They're going to have to figure out a way to put me back together just to let me walk through the pearly gates. But you dead, Roy. You are dead. Ain't nothing... Who going to show up to save you? Batman ain't going to show up. Superman ain't going to be there. And trust me, I need somebody with some extra abilities <laughs> to save me from this thing. I just, and this is just looking at the, the top half. And I'm like, the muscle, the, this thing arm is longer from the elbow to the wrist than from the wrist to the shoulder. So, now that I know what I know, it makes sense to me how they can go about so easily on all fours because it looked like that was his natural state. And as I'm, when, 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 when it growled, I'm not going to lie, I stood there and I urinated on myself. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I don't know. If that is something that every animal does in a situation like that, but I liken it to I'm getting rid of excess body weight <laughs> in case I got to run again. I need to be as light as I can. That's that's the only thing that kind of makes sense to me. I, it, it doesn't make sense to me why you would use a bathroom on yourself while you're afraid, but it has happened to quite a few people. So maybe I need to do more research on that. But I'm, you know, as I'm standing there looking at it, I'm really looking at it and the eyes, the hands, the muscles in the forearm. I mean, her forearms were probably four times bigger than mine. I mean, just, just massive and to see that the, the way the shoulders, the muscles in the shoulders were because I don't know how to answer to what they are, but for something that has from the waist down the build of a dog and then from the waist up to the neck be shaped like a human being and then you got shoulders and arms and hands. I, I, I don't have to answer to that. But I know that when I seen that thing, I thought I was going to die. And Herman, now, when she came forward, that kind of put her hindquarters right over Herman's face. So he would be able to be the one to tell you about the waterworks and stuff like that. I, I can't comment on that. But he still, he didn't try to get away. He wasn't screaming. He, 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 it's like he had checked out. He was in the same posture. So, since I didn't take my opportunity to run, <laughs> like I initially did, once my mind kind of accepted, okay, <laughs> you're going to die, but she didn't do nothing but stand there and look at us, and she growled and laid her ears back. So, I'm thinking, okay. Maybe I can get out of here. Maybe. 
And I started, I was looking at that fence, because there's a fence behind these, the buildings I told you about. It's that tall chain link fence with the three strands of barbed wire at the top. Now, the middle building, if I could make it to the top of that fence, I know I'm going to get chewed up on that barbed wire. I'll take that as opposed to getting chewed up by a werewolf. I'll take that all day, any day. Then I would have been able to jump from the top of that fence to, to the, that building, and I could have ran across it and dropped down, and I would have been right next to Airline Highway. You could hear cars going up and down the highway. And with all the yelling that them dudes was doing, somebody... I'm thinking, I'm not sure, had to hear some one of them houses because they weren't being good. They was yelling. Now, the dog in the junkyard didn't go off if he was even there. <laughs> so that's when I'm like, if somebody had a drove up, turned off airline highway and went up that street, if they had a look to they left down the railroad tracks, they would have been able to see us. Did no cars come. Now, it's between after 12 30 a.m on a friday so there's still traffic out but we, i didn't see any at least i didn't see anything but i wasn't looking for a car because i'm focused on this monster in front of me so i'm thinking if i could make it to that fence i, I might have a chance now i haven't seen this thing run yet and now, but now that I know what I know, I might have made it to the fence and got my spine ripped out. But I wouldn't even been able to start the climb. It, it wasn't going to happen. So I turned my feet in that direction. And, you know, you're on gravel and you do that, it's going to make noise. Because, I, you know, I didn't want to have any extra moves I had to make. I wanted to have my feet pointed. So when I get ready to go, I'm going to go. As soon as I did that, she snapped her head over and looked right at me. Now, she's down on all fours. But her head is maybe three inches lower than mine. And I'm 5'11". And I'm looking like, oh, snap. <laughs> and that's when I... You no, know, really locked eyes with it because she was focused on me like everybody else did. She looked right at me and it was like, run, go ahead, run. See how far you make it, run. Now, I'm not saying we had any kind of telepathic communication. But from where I was looking at, that was the expression on her face. Now, you know, if you have a dog and your dog look at you, you can tell your dog knows you. The look that this thing had on his face was like, I know you. And that's bothered me for a long time. It's bothered me for a long time. But as I said, I got a real good look at it, and that's when I really started looking. Well, after I peed on myself again, because <laughs> she she did show a little bit of a sign of aggression, or maybe it was a warning, because she did bare her teeth, but she never opened her mouth, and them canines that she had. They would put an Africa, a male African lion shank, teeth to shame. It was about three inches long. <laughs> and she did that grin that dogs do. And I'm like, man, it's a wrap, Roy. It's a wrap. But she did that when the guy was pointing the uh, pistol at her when she laid her ears back. But when it was looking at me, I started really looking at her. And for her to be in them thistles, she should have had leaf debris on her. Just maybe some dirt or, or mud on her hands. Because, you know, like I said, it rains a lot in Louisiana. And Louisiana has this smell about it. New Orleans does. I mean, it's a smell. I don't know if it's rotten vegetation or what. But it's very humid there. So even if she had a, had a smell, 
I don't think unless we well, were that close, I probably would smell it. But I didn't smell it. The only thing I smelled was her breath. <laughs> and because she was that close. When she did that growl, it smelled like she had ate something and just never, ever brushed her teeth. It was kind of like doggy breath, but but more. But overall, in a different situation, with a great deal of distance between us or maybe a glass enclosure that she couldn't break, I would have classified her as beautiful for a whatever she was. I mean, it looked like she had just came from the groomers. But the black... You know she was a girl. You kept you keep saying she. I'm going to come to that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, the, the blackness, and I've shared a few pictures with you, but the as black as they are, it's almost like they can absorb light. And I, I I don't understand that. I know there's others that come in different color variations, but the black ones, for some reason, it looks like it's otherworldly black, like they can actually just devour light because she was really, really black. But any light tones that she had, like her eyes or she looked like she had splashes of gray on her, like a patchwork quilt. That'd be the best because there was no definite design. It just was a splash here or a splash there. So once she looked at me like that and I canceled the runaway thing and urinated on myself. Now twice my converse are good and soaking wet and <laughs> I'm like, man, this is she was looking at me and Something weird happened. Now, if you've ever had a dog that has fleas and they might be sitting next to you or laying down and then they make that real quick jerk and start biting at the base of their tail or on their tail, she twitched like that. Now, I'm not saying that she started chewing for fleas or nothing, but she twitched like that. And then she stood up. Okay, wait a minute. Stop the presses. Stop the presses. What I'm thinking is a werewolf. And we're not thinking about the traditional term of werewolf. This thing stood up. Wasn't no snapping and popping that some people say where they're here, where the, the hips or the joints is. Wasn't none that. She just smoothly stood up. And I'm looking up. And I'm like, oh, everybody's dead. This thing stood the hell up, but she looked over in the thistles, and that's when I got to see her standing up. Now, I've never seen a tail, but I saw four breasts, and I'm not talking about four doggy breasts. I saw four look like human female breasts that were covered with fur because her hair was only about two inches. I could see she had the V-shape coming from her rib cage down to her hips. She probably had a six pack. Now, I didn't look lower to see if she had four more breasts as a traditional female uh, canine would have. But I seen four and they were spaced apart just enough by my guesstimation. I could have slid my hand in between the top one and the lower one. Not that I was planning on doing that or had any desire to do that. And, that was, and that's when I was like, and it's a female too. What the, you know, that just took me to a whole nother WTF minute. And she looked over in the thistles and I'm looking up and that's when I got to see, do a size guesstimation of how tall she was. Now I just played basketball for four hours. I've been playing basketball since I probably was 10. She had to be between nine and nine and a half feet. Her arms, Hanging down would have been approximately five feet long from the shoulder to the tip of the claws. I put her weight at right about with the muscles because that's when I got to see the, the thickness of the thighs. Her thighs put mine to shame. She probably would have been. I did another show and I think in the moment 
I may have given her more pounds than I should have, but I know my father used to uh, drive a semi-trailer for a packing house. So I've seen the bulls and the cows because I would ride with him sometime in the summer. I've seen them in the back when we stop to get gas and I'll be looking through the holes or when they unload them or load them. So I've become decent when it comes to uh, guessing weight. She was, I'm going to say, about 500, 510 pounds. And with the muscles, because uh, muscle mass is heavier than, than soft weight, I'm like, oh, you would have did. She could have dunked the basketball standing flat-footed with arm length to spare. And I'm like, I'm looking up at her. And like I said, she jerked her. It was, it was so freaking fast. It was like, man, if she had to reach out to slap you, you wouldn't even have time to throw your hand up. You probably wouldn't even have time to blink and your head is gone. I mean, she was extremely fast. And just that, that basic movement. So she looked over in the thistles and I turned my head and I looked. And I seen these six red lights. Now, I already told you how black it was back there. So imagine being 60 feet back in them thistles where that light's not going to penetrate. But they were in a triangle formation, like a person standing in the front and then a person standing to the right and a person standing to the, the left. Now, a lot of people are saying, and no disrespect to them, that those must have been her babies. I've described how the, uh, the these lights look. It's like if you take a reflector off a bicycle, take a black magic marker and start in the center and start filling it in until you're about an eighth, an eighth of an inch away from the edge. That's what I saw. I don't know any animal that had eyes like that. And plus, her eyes weren't red. But I just don't feel like those were her pups because her breasts were not the breast of a nursing female. They weren't sag or anything. They look like a, a woman that goes to the gym to stay fit. She's not trying to bulk up, but she's trying to stay fit. Because when she went up, there was a slight bounce, but it wasn't a lot of jiggle. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to always disagree that them was pups. I, what they were, I have no idea. Some people have said, well, maybe... That was the government there. Maybe it was aliens. I have no idea. Or maybe it was a different type of dog, man. I've had so many theories run past me. I, I don't know. I can't say yes, definitely that's what it was. But I looked over there and I seen that. And I look, went looking back at her and I seen her slightly bend her hind legs. And she jumped off the railroad tracks into the thistles. And when she hit it, she hit it running towards them lights. But she went down on all fours. That's when I got to see how fast. It, she had to be doing 60 within three strides. Because them thistles was laying down, but they was popping right back up like the wind had went over. They weren't flying up in the air and stuff like that. And I'm like, wait a minute. How in the hell is you going to jump in there with them long ass needles on them leaves? And you just running through. And I'm like, oh my God. So I, I, I just watched until the thistle stopped moving, and then when I looked, I didn't see the lights anymore. So I ran down to Herman, and here come the other dudes, and they still like, of course, ain't nobody say, hey, Stub, you okay? You okay, Stub? No, no, nobody ever asked that. It was Herman, 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 and I'm okay because I was okay. I, you know, I'm wet, but I'm alive. So we get to Herman, and I'm like, Herman, Herman, you all right? You all right? And I'm looking him in his face. Herman's eyes is blank. He's got a little drool coming out of the corner of his mouth. He's not, you know, we shaking him and stuff. And, and Herman, Herman, we get him up. And he's pretty much, I ain't going to say he was dead weight, but he wasn't helping us a lot. Now, in my opinion, we should have went back to the park. But they like, Come on, man, let's get down here to the liquor store so we can call the police. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but I didn't run off and leave him, so I'm not going to leave you now. And plus, after what I just seen running through there, 
my herd mentality is real strong right now. I'm not trying to go off by myself. I'm not. So even though I'm kind of questioning this move in the back of my head, I just say it loud. So we going down the tracks and we have dragon half carrying it. But once you get past that third light, it's black down there. But you only got to go another 40, 50 feet. And then there's a trail that goes through the thistles. But they have been going this way for so long that they've actually beat the ground down the dirt. So nothing's growing and you can actually walk two people side by side. But I'm like, that thing went in this direction. And now I want to go in this direction. They're like, we got to get down here so we can use the phone. We need to get to the phone. So we left the park at 1235. When we got to the liquor store, it was about 1254 because back then the liquor store closed at one o'clock. And we kind of, we, we come out the back. Thank God there's lights all on the back over. There's one car parked back there. We come around the side of the building, come around to the front. There's this little lip right by the, the big window on the liquor store. So put Herman there and I got my hand in his chest. See, if I let him go, he going to face plant. Three of the dudes went into the liquor store and you could hear them. They all talking at once to the clerk. Man, it's a monster. We just seen a word phone. You know, they, and this, the dude is looking at him like, okay, what the hell is y'all talking about, basically? So, finally, he was, was like, I don't know what y'all been smoking. I don't know what y'all been snorting. I don't know what y'all been shooting. Make your selection and bring it up here to the counter and pay for it because I'm getting ready to close. Man, you don't understand. We just seen a monster. Now, y'all said when we was on the track that y'all coming down here to use the phone. Ask him, can you use the damn phone? So if they kept talking. Finally, he said, you know what? I ain't got time for this nonsense. Y'all could just leave. And I'm like... Oh, man, no. So they come out of the store, and he locks the door behind him. I tell him, here, come and hold Herman, man. Come and hold Herman. Come and hold him. So I think it was Shorty Mac or uh, Little Bit that came in and was holding Herman. So I go up to the thing, and I'm knocking on the, the glass. Now, he done took the drawer, his drawer out of the cash register, and he's counting. And I'm knocking on the window. He kind of looked up at me like, What? And I just did the motion for it. Can I use the phone? And he just kind of did that shoe and go away motion and kept counting money. And I knocked him and I said, man, just let me use the phone. Or can you call the police? He said, I'm getting ready to close. Now, before they came out, before he locked the door, one of the dudes said, man, is that your car in the back? He said, yeah, why? He said, can you at least move your car around the front while we're here? Because I'm uh, telling you on everything I love, there's a werewolf back there on the railroad track. Dude said, yeah, right, whatever, <laughs> and closed the door. Now, after all these years that went by, I had an epiphany. I could have made him call the police. All I had to do was pick up one of them rocks out there in the parking lot and throw it through that big old window. He would have called the police lickety split. But then, of course, that brings me to another issue. Okay, now you vandalize and stuff, so... I'm like, okay, whatever. So while I'm trying to get him to let me use the phone, I can hear the other dudes talking, but I really wasn't focused on them. I'm trying to get this cashier to let me use the phone. But once he turned me down the last time, I'm like, okay. So I turn and I hear one of the dudes, I can't remember. He said, man, what is this white stuff in Herman's hair? I can't get it out. And I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? So I walk down there and I'm kind of shouldering in. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, man, he got this white stuff in his hair. I can't get it out. So I lick my thumb, my forefinger, and I started rubbing it because I brushed it first and then I lick my and I'm wiping and it's not coming out. It's not getting lighter. And I'm kind of like, wait a minute, what? So I took my hands and kind of parted his hair and all the way down to his scalp, He's got a white spot in his hair. It's a little bit bigger than a 50 cent piece. Now, I know 110% 
that when I met him, his hair was all black. When he sat next to me that night on the bleachers, his hair was all black. When we played basketball, his hair was all black. I got to see him from every angle. And I'm like, I don't know what to make of this. But Herman Steele is not responding. You know, they didn't gave him a few light slaps. And I think, well, I hope they was light because, you know, they was kind of anxious. So they might have hit him a little bit harder than they intended. But he's still not responding. Then we find out he done evacuated both of his bowels. And I'm like, and we still got to get you home. So now we got to take the long way home because. I don't care what you tell me. I'm not going back through them thistles and I damn sure ain't going back up them railroad tracks. You could cancel Christmas if that's what you expect Roy to do. It took us about 45 minutes because we're half carrying, half dragging her. Any noise that we heard that did not sound like a car going by, if the wind blew some branches together, we would immediately stop and kind of be in a semi-circle, everybody looking, and we like we, we will be talking, but you shut up when you hear this weird noise. And you know, like, what was that? What was that? I don't know. Now, I'm not saying a whole bunch, but the dudes is talking, man, it's a blankety-blank werewolf. Did y'all see that thing? And Diamond kept saying over, go, he said it had titties, man. It had titties. I can't believe it had titties. And I'm like... <laughs> It had a whole lot more than that. Did you not see them teeth? Did you not see them claws? And they was like, well, Stub, what did you see? You was closest. I'm like, actually, I wasn't closest. Herman was the closest, and he's not telling nothing. But I told him what I seen, and they was like, yep, yep, that's what I seen. So that's when I found out uh, Diamond is the one that had the freaking uh, Snub Nose 38. He's like, man, I was going to shoot it in the head. And I'm looking like, Take that pop gun and shoot that thing. You see how big she was? Dude, we were all going to get killed. No, I would hit it in the head. I'm like, I'm, I said, where was you standing at when you was pointing the gun? He said, right behind you. I'm like, and you seeing a monster, your hand is shaking, so you going to. Dude. <laughs> dude. So it took us longer than it should have, in my opinion, because now I'm just, I'm ready to go. You know, my, my feet is wet. It's, it done got cold. My underwear, my shorts are wet, and I'm like, I'm not liking this feeling, but I still am not because I don't know exactly where I'm at now because I ain't never been out here in this neighborhood. So I got to stay with them to get home. So we make it back to the park. We cut across the park, and lo and behold, when you come out the other side and go across the street, Herman lived right there. I'm like, okay, okay. So just like they did at the liquor store, Three of them run up the steps, and I got Herman, and I'm holding him so he don't face plant, but I got him to sit down on the edge of the porch. And one of them is knocking on the door, another one's ringing the doorbell, and another one is over there hitting on the window. Now, it's after 2 o'clock in the morning now. So his mom com comes to the door. She got on her night clothes and a head wrap, and of course, she swung that door open. Who the blank is out here beating on my door like they ain't got no damn sense? What the hell is wrong with y'all? They all start talking at once. Herman, monster, railroad track, <laughs> P. And, and she's looking like, you know, she's looking at me. I'm standing on the, the ground, but I got Herman, and I'm looking at her. And they, Herman, the monster, werewolf. She's like, Shut up. She just said that shit because evidently they've been knowing each other since uh, kindergarten or grade school. So shut up. They stopped talking since she pointed one. What happened? So he told her. He didn't get to tell her everything because when he got to something's wrong with Herman, what you mean something wrong with Herman? What's wrong with my baby? And she kind of moved him out of the way. She come walking you know, to the edge of the porch and she looked down and she seen me and she kind of looked at me for a minute like, I don't even know who the hell you is. I don't know this lady. I didn't say nothing to her. I didn't say nothing. So she comes down and she, you know, she grabbed Herman and she shaking him, Herman, Herman, and grabbed him up under his chin, making him looking him in his face. And she's like, oh my God, what did y'all do to my baby? What did y'all do to my baby? Don't nobody leave. I'm calling the police. 
when she started to go back up them steps, I laid Herman back down so that from his butt to the back of his head was on the porch. And I turned around and walked out of her yard. As soon as I hit the concrete, I flew up the street. Now, two houses up, there was two women and a dude who were sitting on the porch. And I heard one of the ladies say, what is he running for? Okay. You ain't got to worry about that. But I ran through the trunk of my car. And yes, in front of God and everybody, I stripped out of them wet underwear and them shorts. I put on the ones that I was going to wear on my date. And I jumped in my car. And when I left from the curb, my back tires were spinning. When I got down to the stop sign to get on Airline Highway, I didn't even stop for it. I pulled right out in the traffic and because I almost hit a car and another car almost hit me and dude is honking his horn and stuff. Man, whatever. <laughs> I flew straight home. I ran inside. I locked my door. I pushed the couch in front of the door, went in the kitchen and got the refrigerator and unplugged it and drug it in the front room and put it in front of the couch and plugged it back in. I went in the bedroom and got my bullets down and my speed loaders and loaded them. And I set my 357 on the table. And then I grabbed my bottle of Jack Daniels. I poured two shots trying to calm my nerves. And then I started the replay of what I had seen. And as I was doing that, I said, I need to write this down. I need to write this down. So I started writing it down and was a whole lot of curse words with question marks behind it initially. And I'm sitting there and I mean, I'm rattled. I, I honestly am because after I seen it, now I got this journey to the liquor store. Then we got to leave from the liquor store to go back. If this thing is coming back or stalking us, there were several places in that walk she could have ambushed us and at least picked off one or two of us at a time. So I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm thinking like monsters are real. Werewolves do exist. Roy, you don't know how lucky. No, you wasn't lucky, dude. You you know, for me anyway, I can't speak for anybody else. For me. But I know something in my head snapped that night. And I even had a period of time where I was mad at my parents. Because I'm like, y'all lied to me. You've been lying to me all these years. You've been telling me monsters don't exist. It's just in movies and, 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 and books and stuff. Ain't no such thing as no real monster. There's nothing under your bed. There's nothing in the closet. There's nothing hiding around the corner of the house. And I tell you to take the trash out at 10 o'clock at night so that the garbage man could pick it up the next morning. You've been lying to me. But that was rather immature me because at least I hope they didn't know and was just telling us that. But that's what you tell somebody when you don't have any proof of what what really exists out there. And when I think about I got home, but one thing that really just kept I kept hitting the rewind on is I was supposed to meet that chick out there and she didn't show up. And the one thing that I didn't tell you is this. When she stood up and she turned her head to look at them thistles, I'm about 99% sure that in her left ear, there was a gold hoop earring. I seen this bright flash. I know what gold looked like when when, the, when light hits it. If you know you'd be twirling or whatever. Now, there's a 1% chance that it could have been some kind of tag. But I know when that chick came in the store, you know, back in the day, they would wear them big round hoop earrings. Well, in her ear, it looked more like a bracelet. Just for size comparison, it didn't look as big as it would have looked in a human being's ear. And you got breast. And I'm like, so the chick was a werewolf. My date was a werewolf. 
that's the only thing I could wrap my mind around at that time. And I never seen her change. But here's the thing. Now, I'm not saying that I'm special in any type of way. I didn't have people cancel dates on me since then. <laughs> uh, very seldom do they not show up, but at least I might get a text or a phone call. She never called. She never came by because I gave her my telephone number and my address. And she never came back in the store. And I even gave her a card for the store. We give it to all the customers. We put it in the bag with whatever they purchase. She never called. She didn't come back to the store, which after that night, I'm glad she didn't come back in the store because of where I was at in my mindset. I took my gun to work with me every day after that, and I took it in the store. If she had it came through that door and I heard that bell, I would have blew her chest out her back and then reloaded and tried to separate her head from her body. That's how certain I was that that's who it was that showed up on the railroad tracks. You're not giving me any information about how to contact you or where you live, but you got my info. So I started, I drunk the majority of that weekend. I didn't even go back outside. I don't even think I got in the shower till the next morning while the sun was up. And then I sat down and was drinking. And I think I, that's the only way I could go to sleep. So that's what I did for the next three days. I didn't even go to work Monday. I called in Monday. So when I went in Tuesday, I got my gun and I'm like, every little noise that I hear, I'm on high alert if I couldn't immediately recognize it. So my boss is like, she had been watching me. She's like, are you okay? No, I'm not. She said, what's the matter? Don't want to talk about it. She's like, what? I said, I don't want to talk about it because if I tell you, you ain't going to believe me. And she just kind of, you know, looked at me like, hmm. Okay, but she just kept at me. Now, by this time, I really, I was talking with, with my aunt, but I wouldn't talk to her a lot. I would call and check to make sure she's okay, but we weren't in regular uh, communication. So, my boss just kept after me. She kept at me. Bro, are you Okay. I told you no. She said, what's the matter? I don't want to talk about it. Just, just let it go. She was like, well, dang, you called in sick yesterday, but you don't seem like you're sick. I'm like, I was sick yesterday, but it was a different kind of sickness. She said, is it contagious? I'm like, if you've seen what I've seen, it is. And she just kind of looked at me like, you know, I'm thinking this. A few weeks ago, well, not a little bit more than a month. You hired the same rational person and decided to give him a job that you work, you know, you work the same hours as him. He meet a girl, go out on a date, and then when you see him again, he's a raving lunatic. I got to get you out of the store. You know, you, you're no longer employed here. You got to go. You, I don't know what happened to the dude that left Friday, but this dude that showed up Tuesday, they're not one and the same, so I'm trying to keep my mouth shut. But like I said, she stayed on me. It wasn't really that busy. They said, she's like, Roy, you can talk to me. So finally, I just got to the point. I said, you know what? I'll tell you what's wrong with me, but I need you to do something first. She said, what? I said, could you go back in the office and get my final paycheck ready? Because I know you're going to fire me once I get done telling you what happened. And she was like, why are you saying that? You're going to fire me when I get done telling you what happened. She said, just tell me what happened. So I told her. And she did pretty much the same thing you're doing right now, except for she had her hand up under her cheek. But she stood at the counter. She looked at me and she was like, hmm. That's all she would say. Hmm. And so, when I got done talking, I'm like, okay, can you go get my check ready now? She's like, oh, you seen a loop guru. And I looked, you know, I leaned back and looked at her. I'm like, have you not been listening to what I've been saying? I'm not talking about no damn dude named Lou. Okay. <laughs> and she kind of smiled. She said, no, Lou guru. And I'm like, what the hell is that? She said, that is a French werewolf. I said, 
that girl that came in here, she wasn't friends. She said, no, that was a Creole girl. I said, what does that mean? And I didn't know none of this. Creole, Cajun, I didn't know none about And Geekies, I didn't know nothing about none of that stuff. So she's explaining to me. I'm like, well, what, you, what is the Lou Guru? She said, well, according to what my grandmother told me, a Lou Guru is a uh, is French, one of these French immigrants that came over here during time. One of them was a werewolf. And, you know, I'm standing there looking at her like, you know, go on. And she's like, well, according to what my grammar told me, if one of them bites you, then they pass on this curse to you and you curse to roam, spend the remaining time that you have as one of these things, killing people and stuff. But you have to find the one that bit you and kill it in order to break the, the curse. I said, when she said kill, I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. Stop right there. So you can kill them? He said, well, what my grandmother told me is, yeah, you, they can be killed. How do you kill them? And I said, wait, I actually got a, a pistol and a piece of paper. I'm like, how do you kill them? She said, you need some rock salt, some oil, and fire. And I kind of looked up at her like, oh, so you're going to make fun of me now, huh? She said, what you talking about? I said, I ain't asking for no recipe for no barbecue werewolf. <laughs> I want to know how to kill him. She said, Roy, I'm telling you how you're supposed to be able to kill him. I'm like, okay, but it seems like you're making fun of me now. She said, nope, I'm telling you what my grandma told me. She said, you take the rock salt and you throw it on the Luguru because they're supposed to be highly allergic to rock salt. Then you got to put the oil on them, and then you set them on fire. I said, that's not going to work for me. And she said, why? I said, just my luck. I throw this rock salt on this thing and get him extra irritated, and he burning or whatever. Then I get the oil on him. Then I light a match that's going to set him on fire, and the wind blow the match out. So now I got to get killed three times worse than I was going to before I put the rock salt on. That's not going to work for me. She said, you are so funny. You know that? I'm like, I'm telling you with my luck, that's probably the way it's going to happen. I'm like, the silver work on them? She said, well, I I don't know. I mean, my grandmother didn't say nothing about silver, but they have other, uh, according to other legend stuff, that's how you kill a werewolf. She said, so that really happened to you? I said, I ain't got no reason to lie. She said, so I ain't gonna get. I ain't gonna be watching news one day, and they pull that girl body out the swamp, or you find out that you raped her or something like that. I said, rape? I ain't gotta rape nobody, and why would I cure her? She didn't even show up. She's like, well, you gotta understand why I'm asking. I said, no, I don't have to understand why you asked me that. I just told you the God's honest truth, and here you come to me with that I kill her or something like that. I said, but it's okay if you don't believe me. Can you go get my check ready? She said, you're not fired. I'm like, okay. But like I said, I continue to be jumpy. Um, if a female customer came into the store, can you help her? I'll, I'll, I'll take over. Can you go and help her? She was like, so now you scared of all women? I'm like, no, I ain't scared of all women. But right now, I want to keep my contact with females down to a minute. Can you go and help her? So, she would do that and you know that night that that happened to me was July 9th 1981 there was not a full moon you you can go back and look at the, at the, the chart there was not a full moon that's why I was so freaking black out there um I had to Learn how to think about things because that opened the door in my head to it's possible. As long as you're willing to admit to yourself that it's possible, no matter how crazy or far fetched it may seem, just leave that door cracked to it's possible because we don't know everything that's possible and not possible. I mean, if you talk to some scientists when it comes to talking about magic, some scientists will tell you magic is just a different type of science. Okay. All right. I'm willing to go with that. But for what I knew in my life at that time, 
you don't learn how to think about things in a whole perspective until you get older and you get experience. So in my mind, I've seen a werewolf. But then you got to think about the the forks that lead off that path to what could have happened or what possibly could happen to you a little bit later down the line. I don't know if, I mean, I had to sit in and think about it because it's a possibility. What if Herman was the one that was supposed to lead me down the railroad tracks to have that encounter? What if one of the other dudes was in cahoots with that thing to lead me down there? Um, what if my boss, knowing I got one relative in the state and I stay by myself now, she wasn't checking on me on a regular basis. So her and old girl could have been, you know, she could have called her when I got hired and been like, hey, I got some fresh meat for you. You need to come out here next week and check him out. Um, okay. She could have been, I had to accept that that was a possibility that she, my boss, and because she was so calm when I was telling her, she didn't act surprised or nothing. So doing that and then thinking about everything else that I started to learn because I actually started going to the library. I'm checking out and I'm looking for anything I can find on werewolves. Of course, during those times, it wasn't a lot of information, but you could get books on witchcraft and demonology. So I even had the librarian ask me, are, are you planning on doing a spell on somebody or, or are you a, a warlock? And I looked at her, I said, no, I'm just doing a paper on you know, for school. And I'm writing one of my, my term papers. She was like, oh, okay. Because I noticed that. I'm like, why are you paying attention to what I'm checking out of the library? She's like, well, it's my job. I said, no, your job is to check the books out. That's all your job is. You ain't something we worry about. But I would be in the library for hours in the back. And I got books piled up like you see on TV. And I'm reading, taking notes and stuff. Um, my grades at school started to suffer. I almost got kicked off the football team because when we have an away game and we playing at night, I spent more time scanning the crowd or looking up under the bleachers. And my coach is like, Stubblefield, what are you doing? Get your head in the game. You're supposed to be out there. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, coach. I'm sorry. And he asked me, dude, you okay? No, nah, I ain't okay. What's the matter with you? I said, I'm just having some personal problems. Well, you know, you can talk to me. Not about this, I can't. So what I had, to, what I didn't have to, but my escape was the bottle. I get off of work. I come home. I lock the door, barricade it. And then I get my Jack Daniels green label down and I start drinking. That's the only way I could go to sleep. Because the nightmares that I was having after that, this thing is chasing me down the railroad tracks and I could feel her breath on my neck. And then to actually have a dream where you feel some stick his hand in your back above your waist and rip your spinal column out or just grab you like a dog, grab a chew toy and start shaking you and stuff. And then it's pulling you just horrible nightmares. I wouldn't even turn the lights out. And that went on for years up until 2020. I was still sleeping with my lamp on. I would not turn that. If the only time that light went out is when the bulb burnt out, <laughs> that was it. And I quickly replaced the bulb and it stay on because of something coming in the house. I'm going to be able to see exactly what I'm shooting so I can make my bullet placement count. But the drinking is just. One morning I was on my way to work. And almost rear ended a lady because I was trying to reach in the back into my little gym bag to get my flash of Jack Daniels. out. I'm on my way to work. And I, you know, when I found it and I turned and look, I had to pretty much stand up on the brake pedal on both feet to keep from hitting that lady. And I pulled over and I'm like, okay, dude, you got to get a wrap on this. Now you starting to drink before you go to work is bad enough. You drinking at lunchtime. And as soon as you get off work, now you got to have a drink before you go to work. You got a problem. And you're not going to find any answers in the bottom of them bottles. So I called my brother and told him what happened. One of my brothers, my, my second oldest brother. And he was like, I believe you seen something. I don't know exactly what it was. He said, but dude, are you, do you need to come home? I'm like, I'm not ready to come home. Yet. He said, you need to come home. I'm like, I'm not ready to come home. Yet. I gotta, I gotta figure out a way 
what's going on. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm not going to be able to rest in peace or do anything until I find out if that chick was that thing. He's like, well, you ain't never seen her again. I'm like, I'm just buying my time. He's like, so you're going to spend your whole life? I'm like, if that's what it takes. I was like, dude, you don't understand what I've seen. He said, well, I'm going to try to help you put this to, in a place to where you'll be able to at least halfway function normally because I wasn't dating. If it started getting dark, I'm on my way out. <laughs> I'm on my way back to the house. I'm not, you know, <laughs> no, no. When I, that sun started to sink and my, you know, some of the dudes on the football team be like, well, man, we having a party tonight. Have a good time. You're not going, Roy? Hell no. <laughs> Why not? I got to be in the house when it get dark. Wait a minute, what? I got to be inside when it get dark. So that was okay for me because I didn't tell them what, what had happened to me and I never did. It's just I need to get home to my bottle and my gun. That, that's what I need. That's all I needed in my life. But my brother taught me how to meditate. and It was rough at first because closing my eyes, I would see that, that thing's face. So... It took a while for me to, to, to be able to do it, but when I did, and I felt like I, I had control of me again, at least my psyche, I gave it a little $30 funeral, I put it in a box, and I put it away in that closet in the back of my head. I'm like, I'm not going to worry about this no more. So I did move um, back to Nebraska, and I felt... It's almost like I feel like I got out of jail because I know my surroundings in the brass. I've been to all these different places and I do a lot of fishing with my brother and stuff. So I'm like, okay, you good. Of course, within the last year or so, I found out that you got Bigfoot, dog man, crawlers and some other stuff running around in Nebraska. Less than 90 minutes away from where I grew up. So it just made me think, how many times you go fishing down on the Missouri River, walking through these trees and stuff like that, and you could have been being watched. Or the few times we went to a farm pond in Iowa where we out there and the meadow larks and the red winged blackbirds are singing, and then it just get quiet. And I'm looking at my brother like, you hear that? He's like, hear what? Exactly. But I never even told that particular brother because that was my oldest brother. I never told him what happened to me because my family, I knew what they would have did. Oh, you crazy. You would, like, went down there and lost your mind. Are you lying? So I only told one of my brothers. I actually didn't tell my father until he was on his deathbed. And he told me he believed. So mm -hmm. I reached out to uh, Vic Condis. and Because I, I wasn't thinking about cryptids that day. Well, that that was the furthest thing from my mind. I was listening to some music on YouTube, and his show, uh, actually Sasquatch Chronicles, came up in my feed. And I'm like, Sasquatch, Sasquatch. I know that name. What is that? So I went and listened to it. That's the guy I got the show about talking about Bigfoot, but he had a dude on there talking about he seen a dog, man. I'm like, a dog, man? What the hell is that? So I started doing some research, and then I ran across Vic's uh, channel, and I started listening to that, and that's basically what he talks about. He's branched out now to Bigfoot, but I sent him an email and he got back to me. And we actually had four conversations before I agreed to let him record it because I just wanted to get some answers. And when I told him what happened to him, he's like, I've never heard anything like that in my life. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I had only heard about it rather than living it. But I did that and he, um, people seem to take great enjoyment out of my terror, but everybody sent kind words and stuff like that. And they just tell me, you know, man, I believe you. And I'm like, well, thank you. I, I honestly didn't come on for people to believe me. I needed this for a type of therapy because if you carry something with you long enough, it will start to poison. And I needed to get it out of my system. So that helped a lot. But I will say this. I really appreciate what Vic did. But every now and again, I kind of curse him just a little bit like, dang, Nappy, Vic, why did you have to tell them people about me? 
talk, refer to the cha- travel channel. But mm. for the people that I've read their comments, because I actually went down in the comment section and interacted with people. I would answer whatever questions that they had. And they was like, nobody other guest has ever done that. And I'm like, well, I figure if you ask me a question, at least I can do is answer as long as you're not being, you know, a, a jerk about it. So mm-hmm. the last notification I got, there was almost 300,000 people that logged my encounter as their favorite episode. And I'm like, I don't know how to feel about that. I mean, I'm not displeased with it, but I'm not pleased with it at the same time. Because like I said, you, you're taking enjoyment out of my terror. But I appreciate all the kind words that everybody has shared with me. And the support that they've given me it's, it's been great because I couldn't get that at the time that this happened. So I do know that there are some people that, that generally, you know, care about the encounter survivors uh, that have to go through these things. But do I wish this on anybody? Not even my worst enemy because your life is not the same. It changes to a certain degree i mean it's like if you got a dirty little secret and you can't tell because you know how you know um your friends or your the family will react to it and be like oh you know we didn't know that you was doing this and that shame on you or something like that or they just kind of ostracize you and you're not you know you get kicked out of the click so it felt good to get it off my chest and the things that I found out since then about the cryptids and I'm not even going to talk about the cryptid community so we're just going to stick to the cryptids but um, I just want people to be careful keep your head on a swivel because if you uh, if you don't <laughs> you don't have to be in the woods for one of these things to come up and do something to you or try to do something to you. Um, Hopefully they just will look at you. Um, You know, I shared some stuff with you and if we got enough time to talk about that, uh, we can go on into that. But it's just terrible how people just, you know, have have lost their primordial instinct to, to think that Okay, I'm in the city, just lottie dying. Ain't nothing gonna happen to me. There's nothing, you know, like that roaming around, and yet there are people that are experiencing this every day. So I just want people to keep their head on the swivel and understand that. Um, don't be so arrogant to think that just because you're in the city, that there's nothing uh, living in the city with you, especially if you got any type of wooded areas or sewer systems or canal systems running through their um, their town. So that's um pretty much um what happened to me. I just I'm just glad now that my life is is calming down. Um, well, when I say my life, I'm not talking about my everyday life. I'm talking about my more of my spiritual life and the comfort that I'm feeling now knowing, okay, I'm in the city and where I live at, if they're around here, they can only come and be from three different directions, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where they're coming from. So I've been lucky that I haven't seen anything. But if you got any questions, so you haven't. Seen, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, I do. Okay. No. So uh, I wanted to ask. I guess everybody wants to know: Have you ever gone back? Have you seen Herman? Have you seen this girl again? Um, I never seen the girl. I did go back to Louisiana in 1988. It wasn't a good experience for me. Um, no. I. <laughs> Spent too much time looking back rather than looking forward. So, um, but I never went back out to Metairie, Louisiana. I tried three times and I would only get to K 
Carrollton and Tulane, and then you come across the overpass and it turns into Airline Highway. I think I made it a half a mile. And I'm like, why? Well, you know, my grandmother told me a long time ago, if you find yourself in a situation and you get out of it alive, don't take your fool ass back. <laughs> so smart. I've been asked, why didn't you go back and check on Herman? Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I met this dude by chance at the basketball court. He played basketball, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe I found some guys I could hang out with. But I got him home. If I owed him anything, I paid the check. I got him home. Now I got to worry about my black hind quarters. I done seen a monster, and I think it was a chick that I was supposed to meet at that park. I'm not going back into her territory for any reason at all. And I actually had a guy comment and say that it was I made my story up because I didn't go and check on her. Okay, you may see somebody on the side of the road that got a flat tire. If you're nice enough to stop and help them, once they get their flat tire fixed, do you go by their house to make sure they got home okay? <laughs> No, you helped him at that spot when they needed help, and then you went about your business. That's how I looked at it. Plus, yep. again, I'm young. I just seen a werewolf in Metro Louisiana. I'm not going back at 9 a.m. I'm not. Now, the reason I left when I did and the way I did is because I had that 357 in my trunk. I bought that from a guy on the street. And even though he assured me, I never killed anybody with this gun. I didn't rob the bank or any store with this gun. Nine tenths of the law is possession. Now, mm -hmm. with the state that Herman was in, his mom calling the police, when they come and they'd be like, well, we just met this guy tonight. Now, if you observe him, you're going to figure he's under the influence of some type of drug. Or alcohol. They want to know if, if you give him some hallucinogenics or something like that. We want to know where he got him from. To the best of my knowledge, I was the only one that had a car. The first thing going to do is search my car. You find that gun, then come to find out the ballistics match in Nebraska or Iowa, somebody was killed. I got this gun. <laughs> Nine tenths of the law of possession. We taking you to jail because we're going to put this crime on you. Especially with me being young and black. No, I'll take two passes on that. I don't even want a, a, a rain check. I'm just taking two passes. I don't want to go through it. So that was part of the reason why I left, but just a small part. But I wonder if he ever got to speaking again, because you said he wasn't speaking. Oh my God! Was, um, and he was about to have a baby, and he didn't want to be like his dad. Right. Right. Um, so, wow. After I went on Vic show the first time, I reached out to my cousin in Texas and I told him what happened. And I actually had him listen to my account. And when they say God works in mysterious ways, I'm a firm believer because my cousin's girlfriend, I should think that he was playing with when he said this but he said well you know we could see dead people she seen grandmother and she seen uh mom because his mom had passed away the year before in 2019 and she seen mom they were standing in the kitchen now he don't have any pictures of his of grandmother none and but he des she described her to a t the way she wear her glasses and her little, uh, she used to have on the little classic bag on her head and she had her, her favorite uh, house dress and Mika described her. I said, but Mika ain't never met grandmother. He's like, I know, cuz, so tell me about it. what's up with that. So, but Mika, I think, has a photographic memory too because she knows more than 10,000 people and she can tell you their names. And I'm like, how the hell you remember all them people? She's like, I don't know. I've always been able to do it. Well, since she knows so many people, they was listening to my encounter. So she put 
the word out in Texas. I'm not just talking about the Dallas Fort Worth area. I'm talking about in Texas. And lo and behold, uh, a, one of her friends from Houston reached out to her and told her that she thinks she knows who I'm talking about, who she was looking for. Now, she said she was looking for a dude that would have been about our age with a white spot in his hair. We'll kind of find out that this girl's cousin, friend, was dating a dude that he had a picture of him and his dad when he was a kid and he got this white spot in his hair. So I'm like, well, um, ask him if his name if his name was Herman or if he went by Herman. Lo and behold, yes. I'm like, I want to talk to you. So they put us in contact. Come to find out, it's Herman's son. What? And I'm like, no way. He had a boy. No, yeah, he had his no way. Now, I don't want to disrespect this young man, but I'm going to say this. I don't ever want to talk to him again. I've had three comments. I had three conversations with him. And he called me everything but a child of God. He blames me and the rest of them dudes for giving his father something that night on the railroad tracks or at the park that robbed him from having a normal father, childhood with his father. Herman was afraid of the dark. He was definitely afraid of railroad tracks. He would have moments where he was lucid. And But if you're going to go over the railroad tracks, if he's sitting on the passenger side, he immediately slide over to the middle of the car and start screaming, get me off these railroad tracks, get me off these railroad tracks. Going to the movie, it got to the point of where because he said his Herman passed away when he was seven, almost eight. He had a heart attack. Aww. One night, um, he was never allowed to be alone with his son. He always had to be supervised by uh, his mom or his uh, son's mother or his son's mother's mother. But he was never allowed to be alone with him because they never knew when he would snap. Because there was times they let him take him to the park. And Herman would run off from the park and run home and get in the closet and leave his son at the park. So I understand his frustration, but yeah. where he's placing his blame, he's he's wrong. And the last conversation I had with him, I told him, go to take you a trip down to East Texas because he doesn't believe in dogmen, werewolves, vampires, none of that stuff. He does, mm-hmm. you know, y'all crazy. I don't just tell me what you did to my dad, you know, give me something, give me the answer I need so I can close that chapter. And I'm like, dude, I didn't do nothing to your dad. I just met him that day. And you trying to tell me that y'all seen a werewolf? That's what I'm telling you. You're a lie. You're a bald faced lie, dude. Of course, he, he used more colorful language, but I'm like, okay. Um, you're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe. Well, tell me where you at. Yeah. I need to come and see you. And I'm like, no, you don't want to do that, dude. Because that ain't going to end well. That's not going to. So, so what I'm going to do is just I'm going to pray for you and hope that maybe one day you'll find your peace in whatever form you need to find it in. But no, we don't, we don't need to meet face to face because it's, it's not going to end well. And I really feel for him with him, with Herman not ever being 100% again to who he was when I met him. I can own. I don't know what that thing was doing. It was looking him in his eyes. I don't know if it was feeding on his soul. If it was, mm. I, I don't know what it was doing. I don't know if, if because of what it was, what he saw that close. If his mind just snapped and went into protection mode and just shut down, mm. I can understand why it would because I know my mind snapped that night seeing something that big and just. Knowing that you nothing more than pray that you know, I understand how a deer feels now, or the rabbit feels, or the mouse feels when the cat. I understand that, and that's not a good feel. But Mm-mm. without modern technology with weapons and stuff like that, guess what? We are if we in the woods, we nothing but pray. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it's just 
I really wish I didn't have some of the questions that I have, but unfortunately, they still exist. And I would like to know if she was that thing and what her intention was. Which was, I, was you having Roy Tartar that night? <laughs> or did you have some kind of other purpose to be there? And I was told by a guy, and we had a conversation about this when we first spoke, Maya. Um, I'm sorry, Mama Mia. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the dude told me that she didn't didn't show up to eat. Me. She showed up to change me because she was looking for a mate, mm -hmm. and I evidently fit the grocery list for mates that she had made up. <laughs> I guess Friday morning or whatever. I guess I I fit that list, and it's it's a possibility. Uh, I it is. I don't know what that kind of life would have been like. I don't know if I would have wanted to live it or if that would have been living my best life. But he said that she was confused by the smells that Herman was giving off because he was already scared, but he was confused too. And evidently confusion has a scent that some animals can smell. So she was focused on him trying to figure out what was going on with him that he's giving off both of these smells. He understood the fear, but the confusion. And I'm like, okay, dude, what, whatever. Um, I've talked to quite a few people since 2020 up to this year about dogmen, werewolves, and um, I, I, don't, I don't know um, what, you know, I just don't know what to make of all of it. I, I try to do the best I can as far as research, but you also have to have a healthy dose of common sense when you're talking about this mm -hmm. stuff or looking at it. And I, I try to use that always, not just in, in the cryptic uh, world, but in life. And that's just to see something that big and that earring, that just... It's going to always be a question. What I'm hoping is mm. she don't ever tune in to none of these podcasts that I've been listening to. <laughs> they hear me talking about her and then come to Arizona and be like, well, I'll let you get a little bit older, a little bit more tender, <laughs> got a bad knee, you can't run now. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know if I've talked to some people that have just had some encounters, and I actually talked to a guy uh, recently, and he told me about his encounter, and I understand the fear, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not good in any way to be afraid to go outside your house, even if you're in a car. Mm -mm. It's not a good feeling, and I had to live through that for for some years. Um, I've had, you know, when I was still in Louisiana, I had some guys. Hey, man, I got somebody I want you to meet. Oh yeah, who is it? Well, it's this girl named. No, thank you. What? No, thank you. But well, wait a minute, man. You know, I think that y'all be a good match. Hell to the no, 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 no. I'm not interested. And actually, a few of my teammates were talking about, are you gay? I'm like, no, I'm not gay. Well, we don't see you trying to holler at none of the girls and nothing like that. I'm like, I'm not interested. What you mean? I'm like, I'm trying to get school out of the way first. I got the rest of my life to worry about girls. I would just play it off like that. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, yeah, I'll go out on a date with her, but um, I want you to come with me. Or if she sprout fangs and fur. It's gonna be it's gonna be me or her. So I just would tell them I, I'm not interested, and I'm not gonna say that it made me lonely um, because I had my nightmares and Jack Daniels to keep me company. So I was fine. I thought I was alive, but you just can't you can't let it hold you prisoner. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. there are yeah. other people that have what I call that it factor, policemen. But even policemen get afraid. Firefighters, soldiers, oh, yeah. you'll go to another country and mm -hmm. fight against somebody 
and you know they got bombs and missiles and guns shooting back and you still choose to go you got that if factor mm -hmm. but even some soldiers come back with ptsd because of what they seen oh, yeah. or had to go through mm -hmm. so yeah so the creature that you saw compared to the werewolves that media or movies or books is that the same as what you saw or what did did the werewolf you saw look different from what we consider a werewolf? For the most part, she looked like your classical werewolf. I'm not going to say the Van Helsing one or the one off of Dog Soldiers, but I've always said, and people get it wrong, when I say the ears were on the side of her head, I'm talking about the side of her head like your ears and my ears are. Like where my headphones yes, are? Yes, right ma'am. Like that, okay. but... So her ears are like... No, think about Mr. Spock's ears. Mm -hmm. So flat yeah, against his but head. Yeah, but that long point, they actually came up above mm -hmm. her head. Now, I had a guy do... Oh, wow. I, wow that's long. I had a guy do it. Well, her head was, mm. like I said, 24, 26 inches wide. Yeah, that's pretty big. So... That's and her chest, from going from her chest, I got a 55-gallon tank, and that's 48 inches. She was about 45 inches wide. Wow. And I had never heard a female being described like that. They're usually smaller. Mm -hmm. And if there was a male running around, oh, sweet Jesus, I don't even want to think about them dimensions. But <laughs> that's what I saw and I had a guy he, he actually I, I, he did he drew it based on listening to my counter but he still put the classical mm -hmm. dog ears on and I told him I'm like no her ears are on the side of her head now when she turned her head that's why I was able to see it so that would be the only difference and so was her ear facing let me see out like that no just flat you know what I mean? Just flat against the side of her head. Like that. Yes, okay. like that. And then going up. But like I said, when she was, mm. when the silhouette I seen, I could see her ears sticking up. Mm. But it was like not, not wide, the triangle formation of a dog. It was just that single thing. And I'm looking, that's why I'm like, I'm looking at a dog. But, you know, if a dog swivel his ears a certain way, it'll make him look like that. But when she turned her head, that's when I really got a look at her. And like I said, she had muscles on top of muscles. Um, but that, that, that blackness, I mean, mm -hmm. that I, 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 I've never seen anything that black again. I mean, I, I just haven't. And to know that um, these, these, that, Thing is running around Louisiana or had been. I don't know if she's still there or not, but just to think about it running around down there. Um, I don't know if she was killing people or not killing people or she found her a mate on her own. I, I don't know. I don't even think I want to know that. Um, but so, so if your boss knew of this loop, the loop guru, loop guru, loop guru, there must be legends in Louisiana oh, yes. about these werewolves. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, yeah. I did <clears throat> some covert research, <laughs> I guess is the best <laughs> way to put it, because I would go out sometime in the daytime because of course I had to go get groceries and stuff like that put gas in my car mm -hmm. and I would go down in the French quarters and have breakfast at a couple of restaurants and or I'd be at the park and I would sit and I probably have a book with me so I'm not bothering anybody and I have one of my books on demonology or witchcraft and I'll be reading it. but I'd hear somebody talking and even though it looked like I'm reading a book, I'm not reading a merry word on that page. I'm ear hustling, <laughs> listening to what they were saying. So what I found is at that time, I don't know if it's still true today, but the Cajuns and the Creoles and even some of the black people you talk to, if you just walk up to them and ask them, um, hey, 
are, are, are vampires real down here? You know, somebody told me this, somebody told me that. You gladly find three or four people that will engage you in a conversation for an hour or two and tell you what they know, or sometimes be like, oh man, that, that, yeah, I ain't never heard nothing like that. But I was in a restaurant and these guys were talking and they were Cajuns and they have a delightful accent and the way that they use words. If you've ever heard this man named uh, Justin Wilson, he used to have a cooking show. If you listen to him talk, that's how Cajuns talk down there. And it's it's very it's you'll you'll be smiling a lot just having an exchange with them. But he was talking about a guy that had went out in the swamp in the bayou and he was doing some hunting. I don't know if he was hunting gators or, or hogs, I don't know, but they said that he hadn't come back yet. And they think that uh the loop guru, that's how I said that loop guru guy. And I was like Wait a minute. Hold up. He just said Luke Guru. Let me um slide over here a little bit closer. So I'm sitting there listening and they talking and it's like, you know, that thing been running around there for so long. That's how they talk. But like I said, if you listen to them, it's, it's you're like, oh, wow, I'm ready to bust up his size. Let's do them. And I, I got the nerve of I said, excuse me, y'all. I've been listening to y'all talk, and one of the dudes said, "Well, he listened. He said, well, hey now, boy, where you where you be from? Your accent.'" And I started laughing. I'm like, "Here y'all go talking about that accent." He's like, "Where are you from?" I said, "I'm from Nebraska." He's like, "They got black people up there." I said, "Well, it's four left. <laughs> it's four left ever since I moved down here. So yeah, there's still four left." And he started laughing. He's like, "What's your question is?" I said, well, I heard you say something about a loop guru. What is that? He said, you don't know what the loop guru is? I said, no, sir. He's like, well, why you want to know? I said, I'm doing a paper for school on supernatural stuff, but I've been writing about vampires and ghosts and stuff. But you said this loop guru, and I heard that before, but I just never asked for what it was about. So even he, they started talking about it, but it's supposed to be a loop guru down there hunting the people that live out in the bayou. So... I'm like, you know, I said, well, how you kill them? He told me about the rock salt, the oil in the fire. He said, or you use bullets that got brass casings. Uh, yeah, brass casing. I said, brass or copper? I've been copper. You can kill them like that. Take their head off. Uh, or if you put enough shotgun shells in them to keep them down long enough, then you can take their head or you can set them on fire. I'm like, okay, thank He's like, wow, you seen one of them things? I said, no, I told you, I'm just writing a paper. I never, and I don't want to see one. You know, I got to make sure, because I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't want to, you know, uh, have to go to the hospital and then I tell a doctor what I've seen. And five minutes later, these two big burly dudes coming there and they got this white jacket with the extra long <laughs> sleeves talking about, it's a, you know, this going to fit you perfect and we're going to take you away. No, nah, I, I wasn't trying to do that. So I I found over that three year period that I've heard some tales about loop guru, vampires, um, ghouls, demons. What's a ghoul? A ghoul is something that haunts the graveyard. They like dead flesh, but they pack up too. Like wolves will pack up, and they're not above eating a human being or, or anything that's living if they can catch. Um, they they're pale. Think of a pale being. They call them crawlers now. But think of a pale being that's hairless that can go on all fours, but it's like kind of like a spider when it's all on all fours, or they can stand up, or they have like when a, a man or, or a woman is losing their hair, if they got cancer, been going through chemotherapy, and their hair just grows in patches or real wispy. Think of them looking like that, but they usually got not like fangs, uh, like a, uh, canine or cat think more along the lines of once having human teeth that because of biting on bones and stuff they've actually splintered some of their teeth so they're jagged mm -hmm. yeah like that um 
Mm. I like I said, I talked to probably I'd have to look in my journal, but I think I've probably talked about between twenty five and thirty three people wow. that actually gave me a lot of info and uh, one guy swears up and down, <clears throat> don't be down in the French Quarter at a certain time because there was supposed to be a nest of vampires there that would, um, they'll get you, but they generally don't mess with you too much if you are from Louisiana. They did most of their activity during the Mardi Gras because you got all these people coming from different states down there. So sure. they, they, that's when they would actually do the most of their taking of human beings, but then you got people that actually mm. would have a deal with a vampire that to feed them in exchange for a promotion at work, uh, more money, uh, more power. Um, I don't know exactly how all that worked, but like I said, this is just what a person was telling me. She was telling me that, and I just looked at her like, oh, that's very interesting. She's like, so if you, you know, if you want to get a raise at work or if you want to come into a lot of money, I know somebody that can make it happen. And I was like, you talking about a vampire? She was like, yeah, I was like, I'm going to take a pass on that. Let me, let me think about it a few days and, <laughs> I, and I'll show back up. But voodoo, when it comes to voodoo in Louisiana, that is a real religion. There are people there that practice it. There was actually some voodoo priestesses there. And at the time I was there, the most famous one, they called her mama. And if you wanted a love spell done or somebody cursed or somebody dead, you go and see mama. And people believe if you tell somebody, I'm going to put roots on you, you better fix whatever the issues is between y'all. Or you better make sure that they disappear where they can't go and see her. Because people, when you mention mama's name and, and a spell or something, oh, no, no. Um, one lady uh, told me that if you take a man's under, a pair of his underwear and bury them in the front yard, that he'll never, ever leave you and he'll never cheat on you. I had another one dude, another guy I worked with told me, don't ever eat no spaghetti, chili, or anything made with a red sauce that your woman make for you. And I was like, why? I was like, that don't make no sense. You got to use red sauce when you're doing spaghetti or chili. And he's like, don't ever eat it if she make it unless you stand there and you watch her and everything she put in there. Till I'm like, why? He said, because they take menstrual blood and put it in there. And that's supposed to keep you bound to that woman. I said, slap me with a tic-tac and make me sit down and shut the hell up. You, are you playing with me right now, dude? He's like, you ain't never heard about that before? I'm like, no. So, of course, and this between me and you, I don't eat no chili or no spaghetti that any woman make that I don't see her make. <laughs> to this day, you, you better quit playing with me. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that that I learned by talking with people down there. So, but if you ever go to New Orleans, as soon as you get off the plane and come into New Orleans, you're going to feel a different type of energy in the air. Really? I don't know what it is, but there's a different type of energy. <laughs> then you got that smell. Um, it's 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 hard to describe. Like I said, rotting vegetation, stuff like that. But there's this smell and one guy told me that the reason that they have so many hurricanes and stuff like that is because every few years, God has to cleanse the city of all the sin. Mm -hmm. That's why they have hurricanes and tropical storm stuff. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, just think about how many bad hurricanes we have. With, uh, uh, a lot of people got killed or lost everything they own. I'm like, yeah, y'all get it pretty bad down here. I mean, I went through three tropical storms when I lived there and it rains a lot and you don't want to be there when the flooding starts. So that kind of made sense to me on that level, but I'm not sure if it's because of the geological location or if this is truly God coming in doing this. So yeah, it's Louisiana is 
it's full of weirdness. And another thing is, they bury their dead above the ground. Mm, you don't okay. you don't get put well, because of the 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 soil, the water. Yeah, you you don't mm-hmm. get put below ground. So I can tell you, I was going by a cemetery one night. This was in 89, 1989. And it's like, you expect the cemetery to be separated out from the city, right? No, you just be driving down the street and between these buildings, there's a cemetery. So I was sitting there at a red light and I just happened to look over to my right. And I could have swore I seen a dude walking on the other side of the fence in the cemetery, but he was all black. And I looked and I'm like, wonder what he's doing. I really didn't think. I'm like, wonder what the hell is it? The cemetery is closed. What is he doing? Then the light turned green and I took my hind quarters on. So I was talking to somebody later on. They was like, oh, that was just a spirit. He was just patrolling the cemetery to make sure he was keeping, uh, either keeping bad spirits in or keeping bad spirits from coming in. And I looked at him like, you serious right now? He said, yeah. But he just said it like matter of fact. I'm like, okay, thanks for that information. So other than that, um, I had one weird, weird thing happened, and I can't explain it. Um, there's actually a theater, or had been a theater down in the French quarters, where they do plays. But the actors actually have to have period dress on when they're doing it. And I can't remember what play was doing it, but I was with a young lady that I had been seeing and I knew that she wasn't sprouting fangs and fur. At least she hadn't done it up to that point in three months we had been talking. But we had went to go see the Neville brothers perform at one of the blues uh, uh, bars in the French quarters. But where we had to park because we got there so late, we had to park down by the river on uh, First Street and Chapatulis. And it's a farmer's market area. So when they shut down, is a cobblestone street and they didn't really have the proper lighting back there. They had some street lights, but they were spaced really far apart. And we was walking to go get in the car and we was just, you know, having small talk. Actually, we was talking about where we was going to go get something to eat. And, you know, you can hear hard sole shoes on cobblestone. And you heard somebody walking. So I turned and, you know, around and looked back. And there was a guy, he was about a couple of blocks back up the street. And he was just walking along at a casual pace. So I turned around, I'm like, oh, you know, it's get walking. So we took about maybe 10, 12 steps, and I heard the footsteps louder. So I turned around and look again. Now this dude is like a block behind us. And I was like, I didn't hear him running because you could hear him walking. But when he went under the light, he had on a black top hat, one of those capes that come down to your waist, and he had a cane. And he had on black, black pants, black shoes, and he had on a white shirt. And I don't know if he had on a bow tie or if he had a tie, but he was just strolling along at a casual pace. And I'm like, I start doing the math. I'm like, wait a minute. How the hell he get a block closer to us? And we only took 12 steps at most. So I told my girlfriend, I'm like, hey, she said, what? I'm like, turn around and look at that dude that's walking behind us. Tell me if you see something weird. So she turned around and looked and she was like, you know, she kind of jumped. And I'm like, you know, and I turn around, look, now he's about a half a block away. But he's never, you never hear him increase his pace. And when he went up under the light, you know how some redheads are really pale? <laughs> he was pale like that. Because, you know, he almost looked, I ain't going to say glowing, but he was just pale like that. And I looked at her and I'm like, hey, I said, we're going to walk a few more steps and this is what I want you to do. She said, what? I said, I want you to go unlock the car and jump in and pop the trunk. She said, what you going to do? I said, just do what I asked you to do. So I stopped walking and she kept on walking. Then she got about five feet from the car and she ran and jumped in. She popped the trunk. So I started walking and I was kind of looking over my shoulder. And dude was still walking. And he, you could tell he was looking in my direction because we had went out in the street. 
I got to the trunk and I reached in there <laughs> and I had that same gun. I thought I said, hey dude, I don't want no trouble with you. I don't know what you up to or how you get so close to us so fast, but just go on about your business. I don't want no problem. And he stopped. But when he stopped, he wasn't up under the street like he kind of was in the shadow, but he was right in front of this store, the doorway to it. And he took one step back and like he was going to go into the store, but he was facing me. So I went and I got in the car and I started up. And I'm still looking at him the whole time. She was looking too and she said, where the blank did he go? I'm like, he's right there in the doorway. When I started the carpet, turned the lights on, wasn't nobody in the doorway. And I looked at her. I'm like, where did you didn't see where he went? She's like, where did you just hear me say, where did he go? I'm like, but you see him back. And she said, I've seen him back into the doorway. Wasn't nobody in there. And I'm like, okay, he must have went in the store. She said, ain't no lights on. Now, when I backed out, I made so my headlights would illuminate the front part of the store. I didn't see nothing. I looked at her. She looked at me. I was like, guess what? She said, what? I said, we about to exit stage left and we out of here. So we left and went to um, uh, the Greasy Spoon um, Waffle House. And we was in there for about an hour and a half talking about it. She was like, I told you some weird stuff going on because she was from New Orleans. I'm like, I know some weird stuff going on there. And I never told her what I experienced at all. But mm. Uh, when I went to go and meet her mother for the first time, I should have known something wasn't right. I don't put it like that. Because when we got to her house, I'm hearing chickens in the backyard. Now, it's not unusual for people to own chickens. They like to get the eggs or something to eat them. But even living in the city, we get inside the house and her mother, you know, her mom came out. I introduced myself. We was talking. It was on a Sunday. We were supposed to have dinner. So we sitting at the table. And her mom went in the kitchen and was bringing the dishes out. And I asked her, ma'am, you know, I can give you a hand. She's like, no, I got this. You're a guest in my house. You, you do that. So we all sitting in the dining room at the table. And you can hear or heard like two pots bang together. And um, I looked at my girlfriend, I'm like, who else is here? You told me your mom stay by herself. She said, ain't nobody else here but me and us. I said, well, who's in the kitchen banging the pots? And her mama said, oh, that's them spirits. Sometimes they get reckless when I had company. I said, did you say spirits? She said, yeah. <laughs> I leaned over and looked at my girl. I'm like, if you ain't in the car by the time I pull away from the curb, you find your own way home. <laughs> And I got up and I said, it was very nice to meet you, ma'am. Maybe one day we can do this again. She's like, what's the matter? I'm like, I'm about to leave now. She's like, oh, if they didn't like you, I said, I'm about to leave now. I don't want to hear nothing else. It was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> and I walked out that door and I got in the car and I started up. And then my girlfriend come hauling out because I meant what I said. If you ain't in the car by the time I get go, I'm out of here. She's like, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. How could you just get up and walk away like that? I'm like, your mom got something in the house with her. Plus, she raised chickens. And she was like, what they got to do with anything? I'm like, what do she do with them chickens? She's like, well, she get the eggs and stuff. I'm like, everything I heard about voodoo, anybody that's practicing voodoo got chickens or goats. I'm not, <laughs> I'm never coming back to your mom's house again. I don't even want to talk to her on the phone. She's like, <laughs> well, you bet. She, and so she being a smart aleck, she said, well, you know what, Roy? I'm like, what? Well, she said, you might not want to piss her off then if you know she raised chicken. Ooh. Guess what? I didn't live in Louisiana two months after that. I took my black hind quarter back to Nebraska. To <laughs> <laughs> How long did you stay in, in Louisiana? A total of seven years. Wow. Even after all yep, that? I was there for you stayed three years after I had my initial encounter. And I went back in 88 and I came back wow. in 92. And trust me, I had, but I was always armed. I was always armed. And I had uh, Still. a blessed cross, but I never went back to Metairie. Never. <laughs> I, I never went back to Metairie. Um, 
I tried to stay on actually on the other side of the river, where we go, hair hand, places like that. But there's it it's it is so much. There's so much. There's so many wooded areas in the city. Like driving down Airline Highway, you look to your left and you look to your right, and you see 50 yards out, it's just these big cypress trees with Spanish moss hanging down. Just very creepy to see at night. Um, when you are down by the Mississippi River, because I still fished, I just pick and chose the times that I went, and I never went by myself. Mm. Um, there's areas down there, especially by the river, it's heavily overgrown. But I just follow the paths, or I would fish behind this church. I figure, okay, you're right behind the church, <laughs> so hopefully that protection will go down to the river. But mm. um, I like Louisiana. I like the food and stuff, but I didn't really date anybody too much that was from Louisiana because after that. Uh, lady there that I dated. Um, I'd ask people, "You do you from Louisiana? No, I'm from Florida. Okay, you good. I mean, you from, I'm from Mississippi. Okay, you good. Um, I'm from um, uh, not Alabama, but Georgia or something like that. Okay, you good. But you'd be like, well, yeah, I'm born and raised in Louisiana. Oh, uh, well, it was nice to meet you. Uh, you have a good day. Now <laughs> they just kind of look at me like, well, damn. As soon as I said I'm from Louisiana, that's right. So. Um, Why do you think there's so many roots and stuff over there in Louisiana? Why Why do you think that? At that time, I did think that it was just Louisiana. Now I know they're everywhere mm. except for Hawaii mm. so far, but everywhere in the United States and Canada, even down in South America, people are seeing these things. I believe oh, yeah. why they were so thick in Louisiana is because at one time, that was a main uh, slave port, You're bringing in people from Cuba, Africa, um, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other two. I actually did the research on this, but when you bring these people in as slaves, they don't leave their religion at home. They bring their religion with them, and if you got somebody that's already cursed or blessed, depending on how you look at it. They're not going to stay, you know, okay, would you just leave the curse here in Havana, Cuba, and you're here, or if you're coming from Africa, you don't leave that curse there. Um, it comes here, and with the different varieties that I've heard about that are roaming the United States alone, like this hyena type that people are talking about. Um they're actually, people be like, well, North America never had no hyenas. Yes, we did. It was called the running hyena. I did the research on it. Now, the reason I say that is this. I asked a guy, what could a dog man possibly be? And he said, without hesitation, it's the product of a fallen angel and a dire wolf. I'm like, wait a minute. What makes you say that? He said, that's just my own personal opinion. I don't have any scientific facts to back it up. But if you think rationally, he said, think about how big a dire wolf is. And when the angels fell and came down here, they was fornicating with everything. They were. I'm like, okay. He said, so that's what I think a dog man is. He said, now a werewolf, I put them in the category of somebody that has made a deal with the devil and allowed a demon to come and take possession of their body. And that's why you see these things mm -hmm. or it is something that already exists and a demon because they don't have a physical form. They chose to possess these things. And that's why you got dog men that, that turn out like that. But if you think about some things that human beings can do, for instance, a 120 pound woman lives on a rural farm with her husband. She's 120 pounds soaking wet with two borrowed bricks. Her husband's out in the garage working on that F-350, changing the brakes. And because of the jack that he has, it's not high enough to jack the car up uh, to where he can, you know, work safely. 
he uses a couple of cinder blocks and three two by fours as a jack stand. Now he's up under the truck doing his job. A couple of the two by fours crack and break. Truck falls and pins him to the ground. He's out there in the barn hollering and screaming his head off. His wife hears him. She come running out to the barn and see that he's pent up under the car. And she's able to lift the front end of that F-350 off her husband mm-hmm. and pull him out. What type of change takes place in her body that she's able to do this? Some people say that's adrenaline. Okay, I know adre- I've had adrenaline rush before playing football, but I never had one that allowed me to pick up the front end of a vehicle. Never. So there's either some type of chemical or physical change that take place that give her the strength to do that. There are scientists that say we only use a certain percentage of our brain, which is true. He said that we were able to use at least 70 percent of our brain. We probably could be able to achieve the power of flight. Unassisted by anything mechanical, I said, so you saying we better fly like Superman. He said, if we were, I don't know, but if we were able to use at least 70% of our brain, it's possible. So when people talk about, I don't think the human body can go through the change and then back again. Well, that's exactly what happens with the skinwalk. It's assisted by a demon or a deal with the devil to do it. But if you think about, I know the biology is different for frogs and insects, but what happens when a caterpillar goes from being a caterpillar to a moth or a butterfly? Does not a total physical change take place? Now, they may not change back into a caterpillar, but that process, Mm -hmm. there's a physical change. Then there are some frogs that if they're all female in one area, some of the females will actually morph into males in order to propagate the species. And then I'll just take and look at these cases of demonic possessions on human beings, look at what the human body can withstand as far as the movements that they do, crawling backwards up the wall or on the ceiling and stuff like that. That's a physical change. Now, it may be because the demon is doing it. I don't know, but I'll just keep that door to it's possible. Open in my head, but I know with what I saw, I've even though I've never seen her change, when she looked at me when I was thinking about hitting that fence, that was not an animal looking at me. Mm. That was an intelligence that a normal animal doesn't have because, like I said, it was that look like, go ahead, try it, run. See how far you could try it. Mm. I didn't run. I just stood there and peed on myself. So that is what I believe in if somebody can come forward with some proof, 105%. To prove to me that she wasn't that, that's what I'm taking to my grave. Because I've shared some stuff with you of what is considered dog men. And uh, if we got enough time, I want to talk about that just a little bit. But yes. even you said that is scary. But to know that, as in that one video I sent you, if you blow it up and look at it, you can see the head, the eyes, and everything in that window. But yet they are not inside her house. And they're not standing outside. It's like there's a portal right there. And also in that same video I sent you, I'm going to send you the still shot. There's a picture of Bigfoot face up in the upper left corner. So I I don't know. I got, um, I guess you got any more questions, I'll answer them first and then we'll kind of kind of go over to that. No, I think, um, I think you pretty much answered everything with your with your experience are you going to make a book i started writing my book to 2021 um i've I've stopped because i've had some little distractions but um Mm. i have maybe four more chapters i want to add but that's more about what i've learned since uh 2022 Mm. and 2023 but Here's something that you might find interesting. Have you seen any of the Underworld movies? About the werewolves. Okay, I suggest you watch them. There's four right now and they're talking about making another. But the first one and the third one, there's a black guy that plays one of the werewolves. He's got a really deep voice. Well, one of my 
Facebook friends reached out to me, and he's actually friends with that guy. So he put me in contact with him. Now, the only thing I wanted to talk to Kevin about was his inspiration for being in the movie and can he give me three names of any producers in Hollywood that I could send a script to that would give it at least take the time to read it to give serious consideration to make a movie. So I'm talking with this guy and I found out he wrote the first and the third scripts for Underworld. And he didn't write it. His, he didn't have vampires and werewolves in mind when he wrote it. It was supposed to be his message is this is how human beings treat other human beings because of your race or your creed, whatever. And when I say he got a deep voice, it sounds like it come from his lower intestines. up. He's got a deep voice, but <laughs> he's very, very, very friendly. He doesn't act like, you know, he's all that because he's been in some movies and stuff. And then I found out that he also wrote this movie called I Frankenstein. He wrote the script for it. And I'm like, dude, just give me three names because I got a really good. I actually started writing a script for a movie. And I just want to know. I don't want anybody to take my idea and turn it into a movie. So I had to get a copyright and stuff like that. But uh, I recently sent a friend request out to Jason Momoa. And he oh. he accepted. Did he it? accepted. So um, I'm like. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but I just think I really liked him and some no, of the, the Go movies. talk. Yes. Yeah. No, please. Some of the movies he played in. So I sent him a message. I have a yeah. check message to see if he responded back, but he did accept my friend request. But it might just be for numbers nice. on Facebook. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I am. I Vic even told me you should write a book, but I thought about it and I sat down and I did it and I started it. And good. then I take a break because, you know, my grandson stays with me now. So it's hard to find quiet time where he'll let me sit down <laughs> and do it. And I don't mind because, you know, that's, you know, that's my sunshine right now. He's a little spoiled right in hind quarters. Mm. That's my sunshine. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I want to do that. But I have started again. This is my second attempt. I started a small cryptic group on Facebook. Okay. And I sent you an invitation because um, I wanted you to go in and actually look at some of the stuff because I told you just as I told my other members, I have some stuff here that you're not going to see anywhere else. And so I'm trying to be true to that, but I don't just let anybody in because there's some real yahoos out there that, well, I can do this in my backyard or that's that's Photoshop. And I tell them, if you say it's Photoshop, I invite you to take it, send it to Thinker Thunker, send it to N.K. Davis and have them analyze it to see if it's been Photoshopped in any way. I trust the people that share the stuff with me. And I have a member that's in Arkansas. And when I tell you she covers four <laughs> categories for weird I mean that Bigfoot, Dogman, Ghosts, UFOs. She, I don't know what's going on with her that she's able to capture all this, but I know she reached out to me after she heard me on Vic's show. Oh, no, she seen me on TV. And I asked her, why are you talking to me? You know, you can reach out to Vic. You can reach out to Sasquatch Chronicles. You can reach out to Jeffrey Naldani. There's so many other people you could, she's like, I don't trust them. You seem like you more down to earth to me and you're not trying to be uh, big or presumptuous of what you're doing. I'm like, I'm not trying to do anything. I just wanted to share with the world what happened to me and I was invited. I didn't reach out to them. They reached out to me. She said, well, I just feel like I could trust you. Okay. Some of the stuff she shared with me some of it I can't post. I wish I could, but she made an agreement with the dog men that live where she lives that she won't share any pictures of them if their babies are in. I have a picture of a dog man out in the open. You can actually use a garbage can to gauge his size. 
but I can't share it. Now, I'm going to work on her with that to see if we can, can maybe crop the babies out because there are two pups in the pictures. If I can crop them out, then I believe me, I'll post it. Now, the, some of the dog, well, at least the ones that she dealing with, they're not big and muscular. They would remind you more of a basketball player. They're tall and rangy. Now, I sent you a video of that one with his head by the tree. He's not up in the tree. Now, I got to find a picture, but I'm going to send you a picture of the tree by itself in the daytime. He's not in the tree. He's standing next to the tree. But when you he's got to be between 12 and 15 feet tall. Down on all fours, I say he's about eight feet long. Um, it just blew my mind. And then she's got UFO stuff. She definitely has some spear stuff, but she has some light phenomena. And I'm gonna send you a couple of pictures of her where she's driving down a black road, and she just get a feeling that she need to take pictures. And there's either sevens, there's there's either numbers or musical notes that are just in the air in full color. And I'm like, no, that's got to be a reflection of a sign, you know, some sign behind you. Come on, quit playing with me. You know, I called her out and she's like, Roy, I got my daughter with me. She'll tell you. And I've talked to all three of her kids about some of the stuff they've experienced. And it's really weird. And I'm like, what is going on in Arkansas where you live that you're capturing this stuff? She's like, you may help me make it make sense. So I'm not going to try to use your platform to promote mine, but unfortunately, the way I'm about to say this is going to kind of do it, but the name of my group is called it's okay. Cryptid Insights. It's a small group. You can only get in if I let you in. You can ask to join, but you can only get in if I let you in. I don't have any admins or moderators. I do it all by myself, and I promise anybody that listen to this that want to join, if you get in, you're going to see some stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else. I, I I guarantee you that you're not going to see it in another cryptic group. You're not going to see it on some TV show. None of that stuff. I've, I'm constantly, I actually interviewed her last year, three hour interview in the group. Can't, Did you record? Can't it? find it anywhere. Oh. Now, I got an interview sitting in there, a lady in Scotland that uh, researches dogma. And her interview is there. And I went through the same steps. And I'm like, I don't understand why I can't find your interview. So I'm going to interview her again. Uh, mm. But I, I'm not sure exactly when I'm going to do it because I didn't get into this to be doing interviews and stuff. It's just that so many people say, just like I told you yesterday, a guy sent me a message on YouTube saying, you know, there's a podcast that we want you to come and be a host on because we feel like you would be yeah. good. And I'm like, well, what, you know, you reach out to me on Facebook and we'll talk about it behind the scenes. He sent me a message that wants something this morning. I haven't opened it up yet because I knew I was going to be doing this and I don't like to try to have too many pots stirring at the same time. So, uh, yeah, the, um, my group is called Cryptid Insights and um, okay, well, so they can find you on Facebook. Yeah. I'll put that in the show notes. Okay, I appreciate that. And that brings us to an end of another compelling episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast. I want to extend my heartfelt thank you to my special guest and now friend, Roy Stubblefield, for joining us in sharing his incredible story. Roy, you trusted me to convey your experience with Authenticity means a great deal. Thank you very much. It's been an extraordinary journey diving into the details of that frightful, crazy night in July of 1981. And I hope that sharing your story here have brought some justice to your experience and shed the light on truths that were previously overshadowed. And to my listeners, thank you very much for your engagement and your curiosity. It's you that keeps me going. So thank you so much. And remember, this is a two-part series. So this is part one of part two. So please stay tuned for part two as we continue to explore more depths of Roy's encounter. And don't forget to share this episode and please share your thoughts and comments and questions below. I will also link Roy's new Facebook group below. 
So until the next time, keep an open mind and stay curious. Bye.